Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6178 in the name of Patrick Harvey on cost of living tenant protection Scotland bill at stage one. And can I remind members that I will put the question on this motion and the financial resolution immediately after the financial resolution has been moved. And can I ask members who wish to speak in this debate to please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move the motion up to 16 minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to open today's debate on the introduction of the Scottish Government's Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Bill. And in doing so, I want to express my thanks to everybody within government who has worked so hard at an extraordinary pace to make this possible. Almost a month ago, the First Minister launched this year's programme for government, which was published in the context of a severe cost crisis, a crisis that poses a danger not just to livelihoods, but to lives. Now, at that time, perhaps we thought it couldn't get much worse, but thanks to the frankly astonishing actions of the UK government in the last two weeks, it has. Make no mistake, this has the makings of a humanitarian emergency. This Parliament doesn't have all the levers we really need to fully tackle this crisis, but we are determined to do what we can with the powers we do have to protect those who need it most. Now, tenants have, on average, lower household incomes, higher levels of poverty, and are more vulnerable to economic shocks. 63% of social rented households and 40% of private rented households don't have enough savings to cover a even a month of income at the poverty line. That's compared to 24% of households buying with a mortgage and 9% who own outright. Not many households will escape the cost crisis altogether, but tenants are just so much more exposed. That's why this bill will provide tenants in the private and social rented sectors, as well as college and university halls of residence and purpose-built student accommodation with greater protection. The UK government's response to the energy crisis through the energy price guarantee does fall far short of what's needed to help protect people uh, from severe financial hardship. And we anticipate that as a result, many more tenants will fall into fuel poverty and extreme fuel poverty over this winter. Tenants don't just need help with their housing and energy costs. They need to feel secure at home over the winter. Now, with that context in mind, the cost of living bill has three key aims. Firstly, to protect tenants by stabilizing their housing costs by freezing rents. Secondly, to reduce impacts on the health and well-being of tenants caused by being evicted or being made homeless. And thirdly, to reduce unlawful evictions. But in addition to these important measures to protect tenants, the government also recognises that not all landlords are in the same financial position. So we include in the bill necessary safeguards which will give them flexibility where it is genuinely needed. It's the intention for these provisions to last until at least 31st of March next year. And I'll go through these provisions in some detail now. First, the rent freeze. Uh, yes, I'll take an intervention. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to the Minister giving way at this stage. One of the impact assessments that rightly has been published is the Child Rights and Wellbeing Impact Assessment, which says um, the impact of the cost of living crisis, particularly on our young people. Is the Minister confident that this document also considers those people who are children, i.e. under the age of 18, but are in fact tenants through their university or higher education position, given their role as still being young people, um, given that the UNCRC isn't on the statute book yet, but the intention is to support um, the protections therein? Minister. Uh, the impact assessment does aim to, to capture these points, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll perhaps, if I can, take the opportunity to address that in the closing uh, speeches later. Uh, if that's okay. Uh, the bill allows for Scottish ministers to set a cap on the level of increase in rents initially at 0% until the 31st of March. Under these proposals, ministers will take powers to vary the cap and it will operate separately for the social and private rented sectors. Students in college, uni university, halls and PBSA will also be protected through a 0% cap, ensuring there'll be no mid-tenancy rent increases. Um, this, uh, in, in just a moment, uh, this applies to all rent increase notices served on or after the 6th of September. And as, uh, as I've said, 
we recognise that the cost crisis is also impacting on some landlords. And while the primary purpose of this legislation is about protecting tenants, it's also important to ensure it reflects landlord circumstances. So private landlords will be able to make an application to increase rent for limited prescribed and legitimate costs associated with offering the property for rent where those costs have increased. This will be for 50% of these costs, uh, or up to 50%, and no more than 3% of existing rent. Those percentages may be varied uh, if circumstances justify it. I give way. Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you very much to the Government Minister for allowing me to do my first intervention. Um, as a Glasgow MSP, I'm sure Mr Harvey will be aware uh, that the mere mention of this bill has made a significant contraction in the amount of the rental market that there is, and that's directly affecting students, especially in Glasgow University, where they have been reported to be instructed uh, not to uh, even enrol if they can't find accommodation. So will the government minister agree that the real impact of these proposals will actively make it harder for students to rent flats, and this will create another barrier to Scotland's deprived young people from a disadvantaged backgrounds and attaining a university education? Minister. Well, I, I welcome the, the member to the chamber. I haven't had a, sen a chance to say that on the, on the record, but I do strongly disagree with her suggestion that the situation facing students uh, in particular, the, the new intake of students in Glasgow and Edinburgh is a response to this bill. I don't think there's any connection at all. Um, now, I mentioned the private rented sector, and there are, of course, critical differences between the private and social rented sectors. For social landlords, there are already requirements for how rents are consulted on and agreed. And tenant participation and consultation uh, is, uh, a, in, in rent setting is a really valuable part of our current system. Social landlords are not-for-profit bodies. Their rents are channeled back into quality of homes, uh, services for tenants, and public investment in housing. That's why we are working in partnership with the social rented sector to consider the implications of any use of these rent measures after the 31st of March. I told Parliament last week, and I emphasise again now, no decision has been made about any use of these measures after March, and any such decision will be informed by dialogue with the sector. I'd like to turn now to the... Um, I'll, um, I'll take uh, an intervention from over here and I'll try and come to Miles. Katie Clark. I'm Clark. very grateful to the Minister. And on that point, in terms of what, what happens after the 31st of March, is the Minister giving consideration to whether it might be possible to get rent controls legislation, even if it was through temporary emergency legislation and a temporary scheme in place more speedily i.e. rather in months rather than in years. Minister. Well, we are working at pace to get this legislation in place within weeks, uh, and we're working in, in close dialogue with the, the social rented sector. Uh, and I think there are already good creative ideas coming forward uh, about how we'll work together with the, the sector. Uh, turning to the uh, provisions on evictions, these measures prevent the enforcement of eviction action in the private and social rented sectors and in college and, PBS, college and university halls and PBSA, except in a number of specified circumstances. I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of progress on the eviction measures, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let members in in a moment or two. Once again, it's vital that this emergency legislation reflects a range of circumstances that face both tenants and landlords and ensure that responsible landlords do continue to offer properties in the private rented sector. Recognising these factors, as was the case with the eviction measures in the coronavirus legislation, we have allowed for a number of exemptions from the moratorium. These are a mixture of existing eviction grounds and new temporary grounds for evictions which we have developed. This includes allowing evictions in cases of criminal or antisocial behaviour to protect other tenants and neighbours from behaviour that can have a hugely damaging impact on communities, in cases where a tenant has abandoned a property, in cases of repossession by lend lenders to ensure uh, that there is continued lender confidence in the sector, uh, and also in cases where a landlord intends to sell the property or to live in the property specifically to alleviate financial hardship or prevent their own homelessness. These last two grounds uh, are new. In effect, they are existing versions, uh, versions of existing grounds, but with the important caveat that financial hardship must be demonstrated, and we will work with the Tribunal uh, to support implementation of this. Uh, if Mr Balfour would like to come in. Uh, can I thank Balfour. the Minister? I wonder if you can maybe clarify the situation for me. In regard to university students, 
if they don't pay the rent but can't be evicted, uh, the normal place is that you, you then are not allowed to sit your exams and go on to the next year. Does this legislation supersede that, or would universities still have the right to stop people sitting exams and going on to another year if you don't pay their rent? Minister. Well, I'm, I'm aware that there have been some concerns expressed uh, that some, and I think a minority of tenants, uh, it, would, it would always be suggested, uh, might be tempted to stop paying rent even if they can afford it. And that's where I'm going to move on to the, the additional ground for eviction, which we're exempting from the moratorium. We have taken the view that both in the social and private rented sectors, eviction may still take place in cases where there are substantial rent arrears. Uh, I want to lay this out in a little more detail because I know some members have concern about it. For the private rented sector, this means a total value of av at or over six months worth of rent arrears. And for the social rented sector, it means rent arrears of £2,250 or more. That's around six months worth of average rent in the social rented sector. The decision on this has not been an easy one, but having considered it at length, I'm firmly of the view that this will act as a safeguard both for landlords and for tenants. It will allay the concern that a minority of tenants might stop paying the rent even when they can afford it. Ongoing substantial rent arrears can mean a landlord could find it increasingly difficult to offer the property for rent, uh, especially when no rent has been paid for a prolonged period. But in addition, for a tenant facing unsustainable rent arrears, simply prolonging the situation will only increase their debt and financial insecurity and can trap them with debt that they will never be able to service. The protection that a tenant needs in these circumstances is different. What they need is direct support, and we are already making that support available through discretionary housing payments and through the Tenant Grant Fund uh, which was introduced uh, in recent years and which more recently has had additional flexibility added to it to allow it to be used uh, for more recently accrued arrears not related to COVID. I give way to Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs. In regards to the Tenant Grant Fund, that is a loan. Uh, so in terms of going forward, do ministers intend to provide that um, as a grant which would not be paid back to individuals? Minister. The, uh, originally, under the, the, the initial coronavirus measures, there was a tenant hardship loan fund. There is now a tenant grant fund. That's been the case for, for some time. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to, to move on, I'm afraid. I've taken quite a, quite a number. Um, as a result of the changes that Parliament approved back in June, uh, any uh, eviction for rent arrears also already has to take into account all of the circumstances of both landlord and tenant as judged to be reasonable by the tribunal or court. And it also has to demonstrate that steps have been taken to help tenants manage or reduce their arrears. The bill also contains uh, a, a provision to ensure that the restriction on the enforcement of, a, of an eviction order applies only for a maximum of six months from when the order was issued. This applies to individual cases and is separate from the consideration of whether or not the moratorium on evictions will be extended beyond March 31st. These restrictions will apply to all eviction orders granted in proceedings raised after the moratorium comes into force and also apply to proceedings raised before the bill comes into force where the eviction notice was served after 6 of September. It will not apply to eviction orders granted in proceedings raised before the 6 of September. Our aim here is to ensure that no one is evicted in a case started after or in response to the announcement of our intention to introduce an emergency rent freeze. Presiding officer, we know that many private landlords are very professional and supported their tenants during the pandemic, but we cannot ignore the fact that a small minority will try to circumvent these new protections, including by trying to unfairly bring existing tenancies to an end. This is an affront both to tenants and to those landlords who follow the rules. That's why the bill uh, also makes some vitally important changes to the way in which civil damages can be awarded for unlawful eviction, making it more attractive for tenants to challenge an unlawful eviction and receive appropriate damages where one has occurred. The provisions introduced today uh, replace the basis for assessment of damages that the tribunal or court can award to a minimum of three times and a maximum of 36 times the monthly rent, though there will be discretion to award a lower amount if that's appropriate. In addition, the legislation will create reporting requirements where a landlord has been found to have unlawfully evicted a tenant. This will act as a strong disincentive to those unethical landlords who would seek to avoid going through the, pro the proper legal process. 
I will now turn to the, the measures on rent adjudication. This part of the bill looks ahead to a time when hopefully we will be entering recovery from the cost crisis and are therefore able to tra support transition out of these emergency measures. A big concern here is that the lifting of the restrictions could lead to a large number of landlords seeking to increase their rent all at once. Returning straight to open market rents could result in significant and unmanageable rent increases for tenants and a volatile market. In these circumstances, the existing rent adjudication process would not provide an effective mechanism for determining a reasonable rent increase. So the bill therefore contains a regulation making power to temporarily reform the rent adjudication process to support transition out of the emergency measures and to mitigate any unintended consequence from the ending of the cap. This power will be subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, I'm afraid I, I do need to, to finish up in, in the next minute or two, uh, ensuring that appropriate parliamentary scrutiny is given to the necessity necessity for any temporary changes proposed. Uh, finally, Presiding Officer, uh, on the general provisions, we are seeking to commence the bill the day after Royal Assent. We propose the flexibility to extend the provisions in Part 1 for two subsequent six-month period, if Parliament agrees, and the powers in Part 3 on rent adjudication will expire at the end of March 24, with the option to be extended by periods of up to one year. Uh, and there will be powers to suspend and revive the provisions in Part 1, and powers to expire these provisions earlier than March 31st. And similar to the coronavirus legislation, there will be a requirement to review and report on the necessity and proportionality of the provisions in Part 1, and ministers will, be, ministers will be required to bring forward regulations to suspend or expire any provision that is no longer appropriate. So, to conclude, Presiding Officer, we are bringing forward this emergency legislation in recognition of the fact that people who rent their homes are right now being hardest hit by an extraordinary cost crisis. The Bill's primary purpose is to provide the protection necessary for tenants while also recognising the circumstances of landlords. The Bill significantly strengthens the protection against unwarranted rent rises and eviction. It sends a strong signal to landlords about the damages that can be awarded for unlawful eviction and it provides a bridge into the longer term reforms that I set out in the New Deal for Tenants last December. The safeguards in this bill provide a total package of fair and robust measures. This is a government which confronts the cost crisis head on, a government which gives people stability in their homes and assurance about their rents, a sharp contrast with those who want to cut taxes for the wealthiest and let bankers' bonuses soar. This bill demonstrates our determination to use all the powers we have to protect the people of Scotland from these harshest of times. Let us hope that all of this Parliament will do what is necessary to support tenants. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I now call on Miles Briggs. Up to 11 minutes, please. Thank you, uh, President Officer. And from the outset of this debate and the passage of the Bill through Parliament, let me say that I recognise the intentions of the Scottish Government to look at be how best we can support tenants during the cost of living crisis. And from the unprecedented help for energy bills being provided by the UK Government, people across Scotland are rightly looking at both of Scotland's governments for support to assist individuals and families through this difficult period. However, this bill will do little to increase the incomes of most social housing and private tenants. Instead, it will threaten both the Scottish Government's ambitions on affordable house building and climate change, as well as the actual ability of housing associations and private landlords to provide their tenants with exactly the type of targeted support that is required during these difficult times. Now, we on these benches would have welcomed the opportunity to actually discuss workable policies with the Scottish Government. A 15-minute meeting with the Minister after the bill was published and the emergency use of this legislation to railroad the bill through Parliament has not presented that opportunity. Yeah. And I, I think for most people in the sector, uh, they do find that um, will have a negative impact on what going forward. Private and social landlords should have been brought round the table to discuss policies around rent stabilisation, for example, and the further use and development of the tenant's charter. Instead, they have been left in the dark and now face an uncertain future with the significant unintended consequences this bill presents. Presiding officer, the... Yes, yeah. Minister. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure the member will appreciate that while many landlords would not have behaved in this way, there would be a great number who, if the information had come out that we were intending to do this and consulted on it, 
uh, would have gone for an immediate rent increase as much as they could get away with. Surely he is aware of his constituents seeking 10, 20, 30, 40 per cent rent increases. We should not have decided to do this in a way which have exacerbated that problem. Miles Briggs. Oh, I'm not sure the Minister understands his own bill because it's backdated to September exactly. and the extensions which he's outlined mean that this will be going forward with two, ex two uh, up to 18 months that has now been outlined. So I think the Minister probably uh, needs to rethink that because the Scottish housing market is complex, especially here in the capital. We all rely on, mixed housing, on the mixed housing market to provide the homes Scotland needs now and in the future. So this decision by SNP Green Ministers has been made without any consultation with the sector and will have consequences. In Scotland, we have never had government rent controls in the social sector. Housing associations are rightly independent organisations and have been able to set rents each year, taking into account tenant feedback, affordability and resources required to invest in maintaining properties and buildings um, and building the much needed homes uh, which the government have also failed to achieve. The impact of this bill is therefore worrying as it goes against the historical position and brings in the real possibility of wider rent controls for the sector, shattering the confidence in the sector to take forward investment in new affordable home building, building programmes, as well as the very real prospect now of private landlords removing private rented properties from the market in the coming years. For housing associations and for private landlords, this bill now presents a real risk of hundreds of millions of pounds of lost income, and the need to rewrite their future business plans, scrapping investment in new affordable home builds, not to mention undermining of budgets in relation to energy efficiency and decarbonisation for net zero, both key government targets, specifically the responsibility of the Minister, which will be impacted. Now, this bill has already had significant impact on the potential delivery of new homes in Scotland and is going to be much harder for housing associations to plan ahead if they're able to do that now. Lenders may be nervous around lending or lend at higher margins as confidence over future rental income introduces a risk that has not been there in Scotland. Historically, we've had lower rents in Scotland. This bill will undoubtedly, therefore, trigger a slowdown in the building and construction of affordable homes in Scotland and could trigger a wider downturn in the construction industry at the very worst possible time for our economy. Presiding officer, just a few short months ago, Yes, happy to. Cabinet Secretary. I think that the uh, rise in interest rates um, that is a direct uh, cause or eff effect of the mini budget of his government um, that has sent mortgage rates spiralling, do you think that that might have an impact on landlords of all uh, social and the private rented sector and indeed their investment plans. Does he think that might have had an impact on their business Miles, plans going I forward? Miles Briggs, yeah, I, give you the time I think back. the Minister needs to look at inflation across the Eurozone, but more specifically as well, looking at where... No, but looking just, just a few short months ago, both the Ministers sitting here... I can't Mr hear. Briggs, if you could resume your seat a second. Um, We've got a bit of time in hand, um, so anybody who wants to make an intervention uh, should stand up and ask to make an intervention rather than holler it across the chamber. Uh, Miles Briggs, give you the time back. The President Officer. And of course, just a few short months ago, SNP and Green Ministers, in fact, the two ministers sitting on the front bench, were describing Labour's proposals around rent free schemes as unworkable and that they would heighten the risk of eviction for tenants. Exactly. Right. Now, your bill, yeah. your bill will include opportunities which will be also leading to that. And I think that's where ministers need to be clear. Because let's look at Ireland, where a, similarly, a similar policy has resulted in a 30% increase in homelessness. We've already seen, and do see here in, in Scotland and in Edinburgh, a record number of people living in temporary accommodation in Scotland. This bill has the potential to supercharge the housing crisis in Scotland, with fewer private tenancies being made available, fewer new affordable homes being built, and the ripping up of the very tenants' rights framework, which we here ministers want to see protect tenants. For example, the circumventing of local authority rent setting processes will not, over, not only override the statutory responsibilities of elected members, but also local processes currently in place for tenants to actually have a constructive opportunity to have their say and input into rent settings and negotiations. Officer, 
there's a real and growing concern in the Scottish housing sector around unintended consequences of the bill, and I hope the Minister heard that at committee this morning. We're already seeing the impacts on students, as has been outlined by members with both Glasgow and Stirling universities telling students not to matriculate unless they have secured accommodation. One of the key aspects is unintended consequences. Fewer rented, private rented properties... Cabinet Secretary. How can Miles Briggs try to link the issues in student accommodation which happened last year and the year before with this bill when this, no one knew anything about this bill at the time? It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Miles, and it's absolutely ridiculous that you would try and link the two. Miles Briggs. I think the key point is that this bill will make the situation worse, yeah, Cabinet exactly. Secretary. You and your government have presided over 15 years of this housing crisis, and this will supercharge it now. And in the years, years to come, the situation can only get worse for students if there are fewer private rented properties available, and that is clearly going to be the impact of this bill. Sign officer, it's clear that what we have seen already from this SNP Green government is it is likely to use its majority in Parliament to push this legislation through without listening to genuine concerns or accepting amendments. Scottish Conservatives will look to bring common sense and safeguards to this bill and ask for actually key sectors such as the social and charitable housing associations for their concerns to be put within this bill because that is vitally important. We also want to see additional resources for tribunals who will now be tasked with this extra work. And also what is key to this going forward, and the Minister didn't really outline this in any detail, is incorporation of robust planning and monitoring of the potential negative impacts of this bill. That is going to be critical. It is also not clear how long ministers actually intend to freeze rents or keep in place rent controls beyond what the First Minister described as the March 31st date. Therefore, we need to see uh, that time limitation put in place. What mitigation measures are also going to be provided for social and private landlords? To conclude, presiding officer, the process which this bill has been introduced under has been unacceptable and flawed and also looked to bypass any real in-depth scrutiny that Parliament could bring to it and the very organisations it will impact not being able to also uh, be part of this conversation. SNP Green and Labour MSPs are about to use Scotland as a guinea pig and undermine the foundations of Scotland's housing market. Signing officer, international rent control schemes demonstrate the negative impact which rent controls can have and indeed the long-term negative consequences this will have on our Scottish mixed housing market. We know how this will end. Fewer private lets, a slump in building of affordable homes, increased rents for future tenants and students unable to secure vital accommodation to go and study at university. SNP Green and Labour MSPs will be directly to blame for this significant damage done to our housing sector. The greater housing crisis which will come from this will be at their desks. And I hope that they will also make sure that the people of Scotland hold them accountable for their actions. Thank you, uh, Mr Briggs. I now call on Mark Griffin uh, to open for the Labour Party for around nine minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President. I also draw members' attention to my register of interest, which shows I'm an owner of a rental property in North Lanarkshire Council area. Um, Labour will be supporting the emergency legislation this week. We want to see this rent freeze and moratorium on evictions on the statute books without delay. In fact, we wanted to see it happen months ago. When we called for emergency legislation in the summer, we did so because we know that the government has the powers to help people battling with living costs. And even if it has taken months to get to this point, we welcome the change of heart within the SNP Green government. And it goes without saying that thousands upon thousands will struggle to heat their homes or keep a roof over their head this winter. People who were previously just managing find themselves pushed to the brink with repeated financial shocks. These are extraordinary times that have been made worse by the economic chaos unleashed by the Tories after this legislation was announced. That chaos will make this winter longer and harder than any of us expected just weeks ago, and the blame will rightly be at the door of the Conservatives for the sky-high interest rates that we see pushing up people's bills right now. Food, heating bills, fuel costs, and of course, spiralling in rent keep going in one direction, and that is up. I'll take the intervention. Liam Kerr. I remind the Chamber that I do have a rental property uh, like the Speaker. Um, the member talks about heating over the winter. Now, 
the fabric and structure of housing uh, is going to be key to the heating and to the health and well-being that the Minister talked about earlier. Now, one housing association wrote to me saying a rent freeze means associations will have to cut back on improvement and maintenance programmes. How does the member suggest that housing associations raise the money to keep those going? Mark Griffin. As the member had heard me in the Chamber over the last six months, he will have heard me repeatedly calling on the Government to insulate as many homes as they possibly could before the winter. But similarly, housing associations have said that they are able to manage their existing programmes up until the 31st of March, and Scottish Labour will be tabling an amendment to make sure there is additional funding provided for social landlords if the, the freeze goes beyond that date to provide tenants and those associations with assurance that no capital investment programmes will be affected. And I look forward to the member's support on that amendment. It could just make a bit of progress. Um, my colleague Mercedes Villalba made the case for an immediate rent freeze back before we broke for summer recess because it then, even then it was increasingly the only solution to offer tenants temporary respite from the escalating crisis that we see right now. But at the time, it seemed like the government didn't want to, to listen to that evidence. Had they backed those proposals back in June, this rent, place, rent freeze could have been in place months ago. Indeed, if members of the government had backed Pauline McNeill's bill in the previous session, we could have seen far more support for Scotland's tenants. In May, Citizens Advice Scotland reported that concerns around landlords increasing rent was eight times higher now than it was at the start of the pandemic. In June, the ONS reported that private rental prices were growing at their fastest rate since 2012. And during the, the passage of the Coronavirus Recovery Bill, um, Mercedes Villalba told Parliament, told members of that committee, what members of living rent were reporting. A, a tenant whose landlord increased their rent by £300. With no reason, they were forced to leave. Another landlord decided he could raise the rent by £100 to £900 just, having a look, just by having a look at the average rents on the street. Another with a pregnant wife living on a top floor flat with nicotine saturated carpets whose landlord increased the rent by £150 because he, and I quote, could not be expected to stand still while the market moves on. Talking about people's homes. I'll take the, so I'll take the intervention from Mr Mountain first. Edward Mountain. I thank the member for taking my intervention, and I too have rental properties. Under the Housing Act, uh, sorry, the Rent Act 1984, the Housing Act uh, 1988, and the 2016 Act, every tenant can appeal a rent rise, and it would be much simpler if this government had given a determination that no fair rents would be set until this had been consulted on, which would have meant that this legislation wouldn't be required to be emergency legislation. Does the member agree with me that that would have been a better way of resolving this and given the Parliament time to discuss this really important issue? Mark Griffin, I can give you the time back for both those interventions. Thank you, President Officer. I, mean, I think that is, that is a proposal that, that holds merit, but I think rather than talking about limiting the rent rise that, experience, that tenants experience in this extremely difficult time, that actually a, a rent rise of 0% is far, far better for Scotland's tenants than any rise at all and will support people through the winter, which is why we called for it months and months and months ago. But the, the, the Government were ready to turn a blind eye to those calls. We heard the, the usual excuses from Ministers and Government members back then that amendments weren't competent, they'd be subject to a legal challenge, that Government hadn't consulted, that they would in fact, in fact push up rents. Now, those were excuses that have been advanced by the government months ago to dismiss um, Labour's campaign for a rent freeze, but now um, seem to be accepted as absolute nonsense. But I'll give way. Minister. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. Uh, to, to put this in, in the kindest possible tone, surely the member can see some slight differences between what was proposed as a, an amendment to the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Bill and the blanket two-year uh, rent freeze with very little legal justification offered and the much more substantive, well worked up proposal that's before the Chamber this week. Mark Griffin. But, I mean, the justification for it was the severe hardship that tenants were and are facing, which is why the Government have acted. So it does seem like 
the moves that Labour made were justified. But it clearly was an opening um, point in a debate. It was an invitation to government to get round the table and discuss how we seriously implement measures like that. And instead of just poo-pooing the idea and then coming back months later to claim it as their own, they could have worked constructively. They could have included my colleague Mercedes Villalba in this whole process, and everyone would have been a lot better placed for that. But, but President Officer, it has taken a, a month for tenants to have sight of the detail. We will continue to scrutinise the content of the bill to ensure that there is the flexibility to deal with um, the crisis in the long term while well guarding against any potential unintended consequences. Um, because there, are, there, there does remain a, a very real threat of more unmanageable arrears and homelessness after the moratorium ends. Um, it's not a, a feature of this bill, but we would urge the government to renew the tenant grant for, um, funding um, urgently and uh, welcome provisions to review and report on measures and for Parliament to then come back and agree to whether to extend or, or end those powers. Likewise, uh, new verification processes and protections against the evictions are badly needed. But I think communication about the cap, the, the moratorium, and the right to those protections is key. Rent Better reported in May that there's a lack of confidence and some would say actual uh, fear in residents exercising their rights due to the potential repercussions of rent increases or losing their home. So Labour will be drafting an amendment to put a, a duty on the government to write to all registered landlords and tenanted properties providing advice and information about the provisions and look forward to um, sharing that with the government and having discussion on that. Um, but the, the fact still remains though that rents will continue to rise between tenancies at what look like increasingly higher rates and that actually rents will rise in tenancies right now until the 5th of December. Now, there is a contrast between what the First Minister said in her statement in the programme for government that, and I think she said the practical effect of, the, of her statement was that rents would be frozen immediately. There is a gap between that rhetoric and what will happen in practice. Um, rents will not be frozen until the 5th of December due to notices being issued in advance of the 6th of September, still having a three-month notice um, period, and that is um, confirmed by the policy memorandum. But uh, in closing, President Officer, I want to, to highlight what the social sector, including SFHA, COSLA, local housing conveners and housing associations, have alerted committee and parliamentarians to, that the risk of a freeze um, next year to the affordable house building um, delivery and maintenance programmes. Last week, I visited uh, tenants and staff at Avon Hill Housing Association's new Aspen Place development and new warm, affordable homes that we need to see many tens of thousands more of. And they told me about the financial implications of a rent freeze for next year. Upwards of £100,000 lost from the business that would mean cancelling all investment plans for 2023-24 and 2024-25 plans worth nearly £400,000, including kitchen, bathrooms and heating upgrades. Now, given that 7 in 10 social tenants get housing benefit or universal credit, the majority of social tenants won't benefit from a freeze, but will, look at, will lose out in a lack of investment in their home. I think where rent is paid by the UK government, so, is, um, so are the, the increase. And modelling on a 3% rent rise for next year, that would mean that £30 million pounds would be lost to the housing sector and go back to, to the UK um, Treasury. Now, the regulator itself puts the cost to the whole sector at £50 million, pounds, um, rising to £230 million pounds by March 2027, and that clearly would put at, at risk um, the 110,000 affordable homes and all the other measures that um, we would like to see as part of those investment programmes. And I would ask if ministers would be able to fill that black hole if they were to continue the, the rent freeze into the following year. But, President Officer, this is not a panacea. It does not make for a long-term solution. For that, housing policy in Scotland needs fundamental reform. reform. We need to build far more houses. And this, even though well, very welcome, the short term should not get in the way of that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Griffin. I now call on Willie Rennie uh, for around six minutes, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's right for the Government to take emergency steps in an emergency, and this is 
certainly an emergency. It's extraordinary the cost of living pressures, and they've been exacerbated by a reckless Conservative government. But I want to make a, an appeal to the Minister today. It, we will support the bill at stage one, but we are opposed to the inclusion of social rented properties in the rent freeze, and we're also concerned about the inclusion of mid-market rental properties as well. Those homes are already subject to a form of rent controls, so I don't think it would be right to impose another set of controls with a freeze. That would undermine the fine judgments involved in setting those rents by housing associations, councils and charities. Those fine judgments mean social rents are about half those in the private sector, whilst also funding proper maintenance and house building programmes. And those fine judgments enable the councils, housing associations and charities to modernise the homes, make them more energy efficient, meet their climate change obligations and build new properties for the thousands of people desperate for a home. And finally, those fine judgments will allow for targeted funds to be available to help those struggling to pay the rent. So let's not undermine all those fine judgments that have worked well for decades. Let's stick with what works. Well, of, well over half of all the properties in the social sector are occupied by tenants who pay their rent through universal credit. In Cairn Housing Association, it's 60%. In Kingdom, it's 70%. Those people won't benefit from a freeze. There won't be any more money in their pocket. The Treasury keeps the money, depriving the Scottish economy of important revenue and undermining those house building programmes. With this targeted support and the universal credit rental payments, is the rent freeze for the social and mid-market sector really worth it when it could undermine the house, house building, maintenance and climate change programmes? Yes, certainly. Minister to the member for giving way. He will have heard me, I, I think, two or three times now during the debate make it clear that we have not yet made decisions about what would happen after the end of the 31st of March. And in the period before that, there is no direct impact on the rental income for social housing. Does he accept that we are working in good faith and are having constructive dialogue already with the social housing sector to understand all of the issues, important issues that he raises? Well, Irene, and again, I can give you the time back. I, I, do, I do accept what the Minister says, but there's a point of principle here about how the rents are set. The rents have been set for generations, working in partnership between the tenants and their landlords in the social sector. It's worked well. It's delivered rents that are half of what they are in the private sector. So I don't understand why we're seeking to undermine that process, even though we've got a cost of living uh, pressures involved because of all the other negative impacts and because of all the universal credit and special targeted payments. But his point about it's not going to impact the sector until potentially after March, and he hasn't made any decisions uh, about that either, that leads to the uncertainty. Because there is uncertainty in the sector about how they're going to project for the next 20, 30 years with the house building programmes. Even if it's only six months, it interrupts that flow of decision making. It will apply for six months, but it may last for much longer. The Minister hasn't ruled it out. I do accept he's talking to the sector, but we don't absolutely know that there won't be controls uh, after March next year. So how can the bodies plan for the future when it's unclear what the government policy will be? There must be more stable policy environment if housing decision makers are to reach the best possible conclusions. The uncertainty also limits the councils, charities and housing associations from having meaningful discussions about rent levels post-March 31st, utilising their well-tried tenant consultation processes. And I know the Minister has indicated that consultation and debate and discussion can be had, but how can you have a discussion about that when you don't know whether you're going to be under a rent freeze post the 31st of March? The Minister indicates that discussions can be had, but they will be very limiting. Look at what the housing associations have been telling us. Cairn Housing Association say that we are already making decisions to significantly reduce our planned investment programme of improvements to tenants' housing. This will mean fewer new kitchens, fewer new bathrooms, 
and reduce programmes of windows and roofing works. We are also now having to consider postponing or cancelling major planned modernisation projects, such as major renovation of the sheltered retirement schemes. Cairn is a registered social landlord. It is a not-for-profit charity. It grew out of the Royal British Legion housing arm in 1989. They are good people with a social conscience. Why are we trying to fix them? They have gone on. We are in the middle of delivering 500 new homes in a programme. As a direct result of the rent freeze announcement, we are actively considering postponing or cancelling a number of new build schemes to protect our cash position. That can't be right, that this Housing Association is considering cancelling the new build programme. I do sense a real anxiety in the social sector, despite the positive discussions the Minister has had. In my own area, in Kingdom Housing Association, they say the impact of a rent freeze or a rent cap will remove our ability to financially manage our business plans and will have an impact through unintended consequences related to the reduction in our provision of new homes, the deferral of planned maintenance works, restrictions on our ability to provide enhanced net zero and innovation investment and, most importantly, result in a potential reduction in service delivery standards to tenants and removal of enhanced added value services that we provide. It can't be right that good housing associations like that are considering, even considering, measures like this. And that's why I hope tomorrow, in the uh, stage two, that the Minister will be open to amendments that I'll be putting forward I'm going to provide a number of different opportunities for the Minister to recognise that the social sector, the charity sector and councils are different. They have a different regime. They have rent controls of sort in place already. It's well tried and tested systems. They have rents that are half the private sector. Why they're being lumped in with this process, I simply do not understand. And that's why I hope the Minister will be open to consideration of these amendments, so we can end up with a bill that perhaps works, that helps the people who are desperate for help at this time, to make sure we can deal with the cost of living crisis, not undermine the good work that housing associations, councils and charities have done for a long time. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate, and I call first uh, Eleanor Whittam, uh, to be followed by Stephen Kerr for around six minutes. Ms Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we see clear evidence that our Parliament can act quickly to bring about protections for those who rent their homes during a time when we are seeing the cost of living spiralling. Inaction in another place should not be replicated here, and good ideas across political lines can and should be embraced where possible, as collectively we should aim to make the lives of those who live in Scotland better. I spent years working in and around the housing and homelessness sectors, and in amongst the jargon, the spreadsheets, the HRA accounts, the bureaucracy, people, the tenants can often be forgotten. The pandemic and now this cost, of, this cost crisis have put people back into sharp focus. During the height of the pandemic, I was still a councillor and COSLA's housing spokesperson, and we saw a surge in action to get people into accommodation, to prevent evictions and to mobilise the entire sector to work collectively to ensure people and communities were safe from the clear and present danger. Presiding officer, we need to see this cost of living crisis in the same light as the pandemic, a clear and present danger to well-being. Yes, I will. I'm having a menopausal moment, but I will try and, and, and deal with it as best as I can. Uh, Jeremy Balfour. I'm confident the member will deal with it very well. But uh, can I ask her, what advice does she give to the landlord who has a mortgage and that mortgage goes up in the next six months? How does he pay his mortgage, or are we just simply going to end up with people having to be evicted because the landlord can't afford to pay the mortgage. Yeah. Eleanor Whittam. Thanks very much, um, Jeremy Balfour, for that intervention, um, because it allows me to actually turn that focus back around on why we have spiralling inflation and mortgages that are actually hitting a point where it might be unsustainable for some landlords. And I think within the provision in the bill, we see that there, you know, if landlords are facing a situation where they cannot afford the increases, there's protections within it for them. And I think they have listened. I think we can see that they have listened um, to the private um, landlord section. 
People are experiencing a contraction in their incomes, the likes of which most of us have never experienced before. Sure, many of us might have come through the financial crash of 2008, but our food and energy bills had not skyrocketed to the alarming extent that we're seeing now, and our incomes certainly at that point had yet to suffer a decade of austerity. We know that those who rent their property are disproportionately spending a large part of their income on rent and have overall lower incomes. Those who are in the private rented sector pay a significantly higher percentage of their income on rent, and this can be much higher if the local housing allowance does not cover all of their housing costs due to local pressures, meaning they will be required to use some of their universal credit towards rent. Add this to the disproportionately large increases to living costs for those with limited incomes, and we are dealing with an impending crisis over the winter months. Um, I'll take one more. Yeah, on you go. Uh, Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful, and I respect the member's experience in this area. And I wonder, given that, what we've seen throughout this process is that evidence from places where rent freezes have been tried suggests that the policy can create housing shortages. I wonder, does the member have any evidence to suggest that the experience will be any different in Scotland? Eleanor Whittenham, I can give you the time back for both Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think we could always um, cherry pick the evidence that we, that we choose, and I think we have to look wider than perhaps just immediate neighbours onto the continent of Europe because there's a lot of places in Europe that have quite stringent rent controls and a really buoyant um, private rented sector. So I think we can't just look for the, the you know, um, ones that we choose to because they suit our narrative. So I would urge the member to actually have a look at that um, in his own time. Social justice and anti-poverty campaigner Jack Monroe, who is the bootstrap cook, drew attention to author Terry Pratchett's concept of the boots theory of socio-economic unfairness, according to Discworld character Sam Vines. The reason the rich are so rich, Vines re reasoned, was because they managed to spend less money, wrote Pratchett. Take boots, for example, he said. A really good pair of leather boots costs about $50, but an affordable pair of boots, which are sort of okay for a season or two, but then leaked like hell when the cardboard gave out, cost about $10. Someone who could afford $50 had a pair of boots that would still be keeping their feet dry in 10 years' time, whilst a poor person who could only afford cheap boots would have spent $100 on boots in the same time and still have wet feet. Deputy Presiding Officer, with the rent increases in the private rented sector of up to 40% in the recent past, Scotland's tenants' feet are ringing. This evaluation of socio-economic unfairness is hugely pertinent today, as we see our most vulnerable bear the brunt of austerity and, frankly, economically illiterate fiscal events in another place, and why it is right that we have this bill before us today that seeks to place a cap on rents to 0% and reintroduces a moratorium on evictions until the end of March 2023. Folk with the least are paying the most for essentials as a percentage of their income. Women, those with disabilities and from black and minority ethnic communities are facing the starkest of choices and it is incumbent upon us in this place to ensure they do not face rent increases that could lead to homelessness during a cost of living crisis. This is a humanitarian crisis in every single community. Now, whilst the Scottish Government does have, not have control over energy or inflation, it has sought to mitigate the worst effects within a largely limited budget, to the tune of £3 billion every single year. And with these emergency measures, increases to the Tenant Grant Fund and discretionary housing payments, along with... The member uh, just winding up. Yeah, sorry. Along with flexibilities to allow cost of living and fuel poverty issues to be considered, this means there is support for those who cannot afford to cover all of their housing costs at this time. It is vital that these funds are publicised and maximised at every opportunity, along with the Scottish Welfare Fund. And I welcome Mark Griffin's um, suggestion that we write out to all um, registered landlords to make sure that they do that. With regards to the proportionate measures set out to protect landlords facing financial difficulties, I would also ask that we work to ensure where a landlord needs to sell their property, they are supported to do so with a sitting tenant, and that if appropriate local authorities also and also register social landlords consider buying back as many as they're able to. This would also protect the tenant to continue to live in their home without disruption. <laughs> Presiding officer, housing is about much more than bricks and mortar. It is about feeling safe and secure. It is about well-being and warmth. And I look forward to the substantive housing bill to come. But in this immediate emergency situation right now, I urge members to support the bill. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Whitam. I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Paul McLennan around six minutes, Mr. Kerr. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, whatever the intentions of this bill, it is very hard to escape the conclusion that this is SNP Green grandstanding. Uh, this um, SNP Green coalition government are treating this parliament with contempt for the sake of a headline. This is a bill that will create homelessness. It's reckless, and it's certainly not evidence-led policy. Any truncation of the legislative process is bound to mean that scrutiny is not what it should be, especially given the consequences which will flow from the enactment of this flawed bill. Mark the warnings of the expert voices in the sector. They could not be clearer. And deep down, I can't help believe, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the more thoughtful members of the SNP and Labour know the grave concerns being raised from the sector are well grounded, as was cited by Willie Rennie in the evidence of the Cairn Housing Group. I will. Uh, Minister. I'm grateful to the member. He mentions experts in the sector. Does he accept that tenants are experts in how the rented sector works and that tenant organisations have been crying out to this? Stephen Kerr. Of course I accept that tenants are a very important part of the, of the rental housing market. But listen to the consequences that are going to flow from this piece of flawed legislation. I will. Michelle Thompson. Lack of scrutiny. Does that mean now he regrets the rush of blood to the head of his Tory Chancellor and the impact it's had on costs for housing providers? Stephen Kerr, and give you the time back for his intervention. <clears throat> what that's got to do with this bill, I, I can't... can't can't possibly answer for the logic that drives that kind of political point scoring for the sake of it. Not only are the SNP treating this parliament with contempt, but I put it to the chamber, they're also treating the tenants and students across Scotland with contempt by pushing through a policy which international case study after international case study shows does not work. And it doesn't work as it reduces the supply of rented accommodation increases the likelihood of homelessness. It doesn't work. It reduces the maintenance of properties and increases the number of tenants and students living in lower quality accommodation. It doesn't work because it reduces the incentive for landlords to invest in their properties to improve energy efficiency, increasing the energy bills of tenants and students and increasing the difficulty of reaching our net zero targets. All of this at a time when the rental market is already shrinking. John Mason. I, th I thank the member for giving way. Would he accept that at least some landlords have not just been increasing rent to match their costs, but have been increasing rent to make a super profit? Stephen Kerr. Well, I'm talking about the evidence of the general market situation. If there are specific examples that the members are aware of where that kind of ruthless landlord exists, then I'm sure something can be done about that. But this is to take a sledgehammer to crack that particular nut. Now, at the same time, Scotland's universities' funding from the SNP Green Scottish Government is being cut in real terms. And this is a time when Scotland's universities are being bailed out effectively by fee-paying international students. And housing is already being squeezed. It's already been mentioned. St students at Glasgow University being encouraged to withdraw from their courses or to defer a year of their studies. Students being forced to take up accommodation 30 miles away from their place of study. And my friend Miles Briggs mentioned the example of the Irish case study. The Irish Economic and Social Research Institute and the Irish Department of Housing have both stated categorically that whatever the benefits that are promised around these policies are, they say, quote, these measures come with supply-side health warnings. They have been shown to lower investment and maintenance in buildings and lower overall rental supply. Our friends in the Republic of Ireland also don't need to look at, um, at international examples to determine how disastrous policy rent controls are. They're living with them. They introduced them in 2016, and the Irish have seen the number of homes available to rent plummet. And as of August this year, only 716 homes were available to rent in a country with a population of 5.1 million people. A byproduct of this shocking increase is homelessness. Again, according to the Department of Housing, figures in July this year in Ireland, there were 10,668 adults and children who were homeless across the Republic of Ireland. This is a record high, a 30% increase 
on the homeless figure since May 2021. It's just not, and it's not just Ireland. The abhorrent consequences of rent control can be seen clearly in any city or country that has introduced them. Stockholm, the average wait time for rent-controlled apartments is now over nine years. The introduction of rent controls in New York led to more than 125,000 people being homeless, and in California, over 100,000 people. So we have University Scotland, the Minister is shaking his head, but we have University Scotland's response to the bill and their warning of unpalatable, unintended consequences. First, University of Scotland makes the point that it has already acted to protect students for the next academic year, as rent, including bills such as electricity, are fixed for the next academic year, so will not increase regardless of inflation or changes to gas and electricity prices. Second, if the rent freeze lasts more than six months, it could mean that the cost of running student accommodation will become financially unviable, putting jobs at risk and reducing, further reducing supply. Third, th 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 this is from University of Scotland. Third, and I asked the Minister to make the Government's position very clear on this point. University of Scotland state that banning eviction would put students at risk if universities are unable to evict an individual whom they believe poses a risk of sexual or physical violence to other students. I'm willing to take an intervention. Minister. I'm grateful. The member will be well aware that as with the temporary restrictions under the coronavirus legislation, criminal and antisocial behaviour and that's not just criminal, antisocial behaviour as well, is very clearly exempted from the moratorium on eviction, just as it was in the previous emergency legislation. Stephen Kerr, would be grateful if, if you could begin to wind up, please. If an individual is believed to pose a risk in terms of sexual or physical violence, they can be evicted. Is that what the Minister is saying? Can you shake your head, Minister? Well, that is not, that is not what I'm asking. So I think we need some clarification from the Minister on that. From you, this is what University of Scotland are asking. If the universities, I'm sorry to indulge the patience of the Deputy Presiding Officer. Fourth, if the, minister, if the universities can't ask students to depart accommodation on terms agreed, then this will put vitally important revenue generating summer events at risk. It will also put at risk accommodation for the following academic year's first year student intake. That's a very important consideration. And finally, University of Scotland believe that the focus should be on long-term strategy and not on this emergency bill that has had so little, <coughs> so little strategy. I think the Minister should deal with each of these concerns expressed by Uni University of Scotland in, in, in his or her response to this debate. And at that, I will conclude. Very grateful, Mr. Kerr. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Richard Leonard for around six minutes. Mr. McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I refer members to my register of interests. I own a rental property uh, in East Lothian. This week is Challenge Poverty Week, and this is exactly why we are here today with this bill being brought forward. It, they say a week is a long time in politics. It's an old saying, but still so true. Just ask Quasi Quarting. The cost of living crisis has been building for a long period of time, and it's hitting the poorest in our community. Again, that's why we're here today. Of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has exacerbated the issue in terms of inflationary pressures, but those pressures were there before then. The price energy cap it was set at an average 2,500. A reminder, it was 1,100 in 2019. <laughs> However, the 2,500 is an average, not a limit. Maybe somebody should tell Liz Trust that too. Recent studies show that 25% of people in Scotland and up to 35% of single-parent families will not be putting the heating on this year. For context, that's 25,000 residents in East Lothian. 72% of residents are projected to be in fuel poverty in Scotland this winter. That's over 70,000 residents in East Lothian. Rental costs are usually the biggest costs for everyone. Inflation is projected by some commentators to rise to 22%, and that's the fault of the UK government. Believe me, believe me that. And food inflation at the moment is forecast around about 13%. Yeah, well, yeah. So he Kerr. makes a point about inflation and then tries to blame the UK government exclusively. Is the UK government also responsible for inflation rate in Germany of 10%, the EU 10.1%, Australia 10.5%, Austria Belgium 11.27%, Greece 114 Netherlands 12 Romania 15.3%, Hungary 15.6%, Poland 17.7%. Is the UK government also responsible for that inflation? Paul McLennan, give yeah. your time back. No, it's not, Mr Kerr, but you will know it's the highest rate projected in, in the G7, and that's the fault. That, oh yes, it is, and that's the fault of the UK government. 
Now, Scottish Government mitigates Tory UK Government policy choices by over £700 million per year. That's the cost of this broken United Kingdom. The United Kingdom that prioritises the most well-off in our society over the most vulnerable in our society. A United Kingdom that will borrow to cut taxes for millionaires over people who don't earn enough to pay tax. No, I won't, sorry. This is all about Prime Minister who not only dresses like Margaret Thatcher, but tries to emulate her policies with a perverse ideology. And not only the Tory party are now, the Tory party are touting the possibility of cutting benefits, placing more people into poverty. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm setting the context, so no, I won't take, a, won't take a, a, an intervention. I'm setting the context of this. How many policy reversals will Douglas Ross support? He's the Kennedy Gleish of Scottish politics. Maybe he's aye, maybe he's no. That's the context, McLean, and that's the problem you please facing many your seat. players in Scotland. Please resume your seat. Yep. Liam Kerr, point of order. 7.2, uh, I think it is, requires that the member address himself to the subject of the motion. I would suggest that the member does that. Thank you. Uh, Mr Kerr, as Mr McLennan, I think, has indicated, he is setting the scene. I would hope that he will return to the subject of, the, uh, of this afternoon's debate. And with that, Paul McLennan, I can yeah. give you the time back. Yeah. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Does Mr McLennan have an obligation to give points of truth and fact in this debate? Or is he, or is he completely unrestrained when it comes to, those, uh, to, to that obligation? Mr Kerr, I think you will know at this point that that is a debating point rather than a point of order. Uh, Paul McLennan, please resume. Yes, thank you, President Officer. My last line was, that's the context, that's a problem facing many players, eh, many players in Scotland. Many players in Scotland. So that, the context is important. My very next line is, so what can Scottish Government do to help on top of the £700 million that it mitigates every year within a fixed budget that's not inflation-proof, nor has the borrowing ability to support those most affected? That's why the bill to freeze rents and safeguard against evictions has been brought forward, because of the context that the UK Government has set. I'm proud to be part of a Government that supports our residents in this way. This emergency legislation simply seeks to increase protection for tenants from rent rises and eviction action during the cost of living crisis created by the Tory Government. If approved, this bill will give Ministers temporary power to cap rents for private and social tenancies with a cap set at 0% from 6, uh, April, uh, 6 September until the 31st of March next year. The bill also includes the further power to maintain or vary the rent cap over two further six-year periods. The Local Government Housing Planning Committee, uh, six-month periods, the Local Government and Housing Planning Committee will be reviewing this legislation over the next month, six months in a regular period. We discussed that with the Minister this morning, and he was quite happy to advise us of that. Enforcement of eviction actions resulting from cost crisis will be prevented over the same period except in a number of specified circumstances, which the Minister has talked about. Damages for unlawful evictions will be increased to a maximum of 36 months worth of rent. Now, crucially, these measures will also apply to students in college or university halls of residence or other types of purpose-built accommodation. Now, in the summer, and I know some other MSPs were at the time, we heard from the NES about rent rises of over 30 per cent over a number of years. It was clear that this was a deterrent to choose, uh, from those choosing to study. The Scottish Government has also recognised that the rental sector is a source of income for many in Scotland. That is why the legislation includes safeguards for private sector landlords, allowing them to apply to increased rent to partially cover a limited number of specified costs, including increased mortgage interest payments on the property they are letting, an increase in landlord's insurance, or increases in service charges paid as part of the tenancy, subject to an overall limit. President Officer, I want to close with four priority areas that were raised in the joint briefing from Citizens Advice Scotland, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Poverty Alliance and Shelter Scotland. The four priorities were protect all tenants from rent increases and eviction, except in cases of antisocial or criminal behaviour. Recognise and address unintended consequences for both tenants and landlords. Three, incorporate a robust plan for monitoring impact. And four, be accompanied by an immediate plan to raise tenant landlord awareness of the changes in the financial help on offer to households that are struggling. I believe the Minister has touched on that in his introduction today. So I can ask the Cabinet Secretary, who may be summing up, to just touch his and sum up. I am proud to be supporting this bill at stage one. It is looking after the most vulnerable people in our society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McLennan. I now call Richard Leonard to be followed by uh, Jackie Dunbar. Richard Leonard, for around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Until yesterday afternoon, the Minister for Zero Carbon Buildings, Active Travel and Tenants' Rights has been very coy about this emergency legislation. I have written to him. I know that Mercedes Villalba, who is sadly unable to be here today, who has courageously led Parliament in this campaign for a meaningful rent freeze has written to him, seeking clarity. 
but he refused to give it. What we do know is that the Scottish Association of Landlords met with the government just last week and they could tell their members after that meeting, and let me quote them, it is expected that landlords will still be permitted to serve tenants with notice to end the tenancy as normal. If the tenant doesn't vacate during the notice period, landlords can then apply to the tribunal for an eviction order as normal. They go on. If the eviction ban was to be extended beyond the 31st of March 2023, then each individual eviction order would be subject to a maximum delay of six months, e.g. an eviction order issued in December 2022 could be enforced in June 2023 at the latest, or on the 1st of April 2023 if the ban isn't extended and the bill confirms this to be true. So this is an eviction ban, but the best that can be said of it it is that it is a temporary, it is a deficient, it is a demi-semi eviction ban. A ban in which tenants can still be served with a notice of eviction, which does not make it any harder for landlords to evict tenants, which does not strengthen tenants' rights, which simply pauses the eviction for a time-limited period. And let me turn to the rent freeze. This is what the Scottish Association of Landlords said about that. Rent increase notices issued before the 6th of September are expected to be enforceable as normal. It is possible that safeguards may be put in place to allow rent increases in exceptional cases where a landlord can demonstrate that without one they will suffer, in their words, extreme financial hardship. They go on, the rent freeze will only apply to mid-tenancy rent increases and will not affect a landlord's ability to apply a rent increase between tenancies. And the bill confirms that this is true. So this is not only a long way from a universal freeze on rents, there is a real danger that the government's promise of a rent freeze, this most significant announcement, in the words of the First Minister, will melt under the heat of fact. I'll give way. Minister. Uh, I'm grateful to, to Richard Leonard for giving way. I, I've laid out exactly why this needs to be a balanced package, and I've been saying since uh, the member's colleague moved an amendment back in June that a, a universal blanket approach would almost certainly fail the test of proportionality. So I, I'm a little bit confused why the member is using his speech simply to read out what I've already said is the government position in an ever, ever more angry tone of voice. <laughs> Richard Leonard, I didn't give you the time back. Um, well, I will choose to speak in whichever tone I wish, uh, Mr Harvey. <laughs> and I will, and I will uh, include the content that I wish to include in my speech. And I won't be dictated to by you, whether you're on the front bench or not. <laughs> and I'm bound to say to the Scottish Association of Landlords, if you are concerned that the proposals will cause extreme financial hardship for your members, what about the extreme financial hardship your members are imposing on tenants? And if landlords are complaining that their altruism is being tested, that a temporary rent freeze will drive them out of business, and so the supply of homes for rent in Scotland will dry up, I say to them, if this really is about altruism, why not sell your private rental properties to the public sector so they can become socially rented homes and the tenants can stay? What we truly need is a rebalancing of power between landlord and tenant. At the moment, if a tenant considers their rent to be unfair, the onus is on them. Firstly, to know that there is such a thing as a rent officer. Secondly, to know where to find a rent officer. Thirdly, to contact that rent officer and get them to undertake an assessment. And fourthly, to then negotiate the implementation of that fair rent with the landlord themselves. So I say to the Minister for Tenants' Rights, why shouldn't the burden of proof be placed on the landlord to justify any rent rise rather than on the tenant to win a case against it? A constituent of mine, Ashley, contacted me a day or so after the First Minister's announcement to say that her letting agency had sent her a contract 
which puts up her rent from 475 to 530 pounds a month. Her rent doesn't include her bills like gas and electricity. The mortgage on the property is paid off. In other words, there is no justification for this huge rise whatsoever. I've got a letter here. She told me it's hard for everyone right now. My gas is up, my electric's up. What a time to pick to up my rent as well. Ashley has not signed the contract, but she doesn't know if the rent freeze will apply to her or whether at the end of this month she will have to start stumping up this 11.5% hike. Ashley said to me, I personally don't think it's fair that only some rents will be frozen. She is right, and Ashley speaks for thousands of young people like her. So a temporary freeze will not help. If it is designed to take the heat out of this effective grassroots campaign that has got us to where we are today, it will not work. We need proper rent controls. That's what this parliament must legislate for. Instead of short-term emergency legislation, we need long-term transformational change to tackle the housing crisis, cr crisis, to tackle unaffordability, overcrowding and homelessness, and to take on the rogue landlords and properly protect tenants. Because without tackling insecurity and the soaring cost of housing, we cannot begin to tackle inequality. And without tackling inequality and injustices in housing, we will never tackle it in wider society. We must be on the side of the tenant, not the landlord. And today we must deliver with action and not just with words. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I now call uh, Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Jeremy Balfour uh, for around six minutes. Uh, Mr. Thank Dunbar. you, Presiding Officer, and I'll try not to use my angry voice um, today. I'll try and use my reasonable one. Um, Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. And while the Scottish Government doesn't have the power to prevent people's energy bills from soaring, it is right that it has taken action to ensure that their rent does not rise and that they are not evicted from their homes over winter. I therefore welcome that this emergency legislation will ensure that this is done in a way that is legally robust with the right safeguards in place. The bill aims to restrict landlords from raising rents, with exceptions as we have heard, until March 2023, and also puts a ban on evictions for the same period. Rents will be frozen unless landlords are experiencing increased property costs, such as increased mortgage interest or service charges, the Bill confirms. I think it's important to point out that the landlords will be able to evict tenants, but only if they can prove that they are suffering from financial hardship. And this isn't necessarily obvious from the commentary from the media and indeed some landlords. Under the Bill, rent can still be increased between tenancies under these proposals, with the policy notes attached to the bill stating, and I quote, the rent freeze protects tenants, helping them to stay in their homes during the cost crisis while responding to the need to ensure that the measures are proportionate. The cap on rent increases will initially be set at 0%, meaning no rises will be permissible in the short term. But the government has made clear that this will be until March 2023, until the policy will be reviewed. Presiding officer, my Aberdeen Donside constituency has many people living in socially rented accommodation as well as private lets. Many of my constituents will be among the hardest hit by the Tory made cost crisis. And tenants, especially in the private rented sector, spend a greater proportion of their income on housing than people who own their own homes. People who rent have, on average, lower incomes and poorer energy standards. And recent research by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation found that almost a third of people who rent their homes in Scotland were already finding it difficult to pay their rent before the current cost crisis hit. We face the threat of a humanitarian emergency in every community across Scotland. And it is the, the responsible move from the Scottish Government, in the absence of the powers to act properly on energy bills, to act through this emergency legislation which will protect the most vulnerable in our society. It is also worth noting the organisations who have welcomed this legislation. The Poverty Alliance said a rent freeze will help tenants across the country. Shelter Scotland has stated that short-term emergency measures in the programme for government 
are great news for tenants and will stop people from losing their homes. Shelter Scotland also told Parliament that any measures to ensure citizens have the access to the right to a home are very welcome in the context of the cost of living, though they wait to see the final detail. Live and Rent said a rent freeze would have a massive impact as skyrocketing rents continue to pile on top of out-of-control energy bills. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful uh, to Jackie Dunbar for giving way. Did she receive briefing papers from housing associations? And particularly, did she receive the briefing paper from the Cairn Housing Group? And how does she respond to their sincerely held concerns? Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Yes, I did receive uh, the briefing papers, as I'm sure that, that Mr Kerr has done uh, as well, and I have read them over just as much as he has done, and I know that the government have done as well. Um, and the Scottish Trade Union's uh, Congress has stated that the Scottish Government is to be commended for, for freezing rents. If implemented correctly and we are pressing for further answers, this will help thousands of households across Scotland when they need it most. When used, the powers of our Parliament can bring positive change. These expert testimonies from the organisations on the front line of the cost crisis speak for themselves and show the absolute need for this bill. It remains essential that tenants continue to pay their rent and anyone struggling to do so should contact their landlord at the earliest possible opportunity. This legislation aims to freeze rents at an affordable level so that folk are able to continue paying their bills and not fall into arrears. Tenants and landlords who are willing to work together to address rent arrears can receive support from the Scottish Government and local authorities such as through the Tenant Grant Fund and discretionary housing payments. Indeed, I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to continue to engage with landlords as well as housing author authorities while this legislation is in place and up to March. Very quickly. Emma Harper, briefly. Thank you. I will be brief, presiding officer. I met with one of the chief execs of a local housing association in South Scotland yesterday, and they have concerns uh, over the impact of their, uh, the rent cap on future development and maintenance and support. But I understand that the plans for the housing authorities, as they are already set, are up until uh, 1st of April. So would Jackie um, Dunbar agree with me that the Cabinet Secretary should um, seek a commitment to engage with the housing authorities continuously for uh, the process as we go ahead? Jackie Dunbar, and please be winding up now. Thank you, the President Officer. Yes, I could absolutely agree with my colleague Emma Harper. And as a former Vice Convener and also a former uh, spokesperson for housing for the SNP Group in Aberdeen City Council, I know that most uh, social sector rents are already set until the 1st of April 2023. So having this temporary measure in place until March should not uh, financially impact on housing authorities or the social landlords. And I'll, I will join Emma Harper in asking the Cabinet Secretary to reaffirm her commitment to keeping housing authorities fully informed with the government's plans as we approach March. In closing, presiding officer, during the current UK government made cost crisis, I welcome this emergency legislation from the Scottish Government, which will work to protect my Aberdeen Donside constituents as well as folk across Scotland during the winter months. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dunbar. Um, I now call Jeremy Balfour, who will be followed by Michelle Thompson. I can advise the Chamber most of the time we had in hand has now been used up, uh, so I'm going to have to uh, require uh, speakers to stick to their uh, speaking allocations for around six minutes, Mr. Balfour. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The world is in a grip of an economic crisis, the likes of which we have not seen in a number of years. As a result of global factors, the people of this country are facing down an incredibly difficult winter and it is incumbent upon all governments to provide. However, President Officer, when governments are considering measures to implement, there must be due consideration given to the potential consequences out with the primary intent of the legislation. It is very rare that any action or piece of legislation has no consequence outside of the area that is directed to. In this vein, I have real reservations about the proposed rent control measures that the government is bringing forward today. Unintended consequences will lead to, pot 
policy promises that could be devastating, particularly to the people I represent here in Malovian. The Scottish Government is far from the first to have this idea. There's an example after example of rent control schemes that have been implemented only to be rolled back after the disastrous unintended effects manifested themselves. As others have mentioned, look at what happened in Germany. They were hailed as a policy that would fix every problem that the market couldn't. The same was said of the rent pressure zones that were introduced in Dublin. Both cases were supposed to ensure affordable rent for all, but instead they manufactured an extreme shortage of available properties to rent and drove many landlords from the market. The number of classified adverts for rental properties fell by half as a result of the measures in Berlin. And according to the economist Jim Powers, the Irish rent pressure zones are causing, I quote, an exit of private landlords from the market and is reducing the supply of rental property and putting upward pressure on rents at a time when significant increases are required to satisfy demand, create a functional residential property market. President officer, the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Certainly. Jim Fairley. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Does the member not recognise that this is actually temporary legislation to get over a cost of living crisis created by the government that he represents in Westminster? Jeremy Balfour. Well, the legislation that we are debating this afternoon within this parliament gives the power of Scottish Government to extend this for 18 months. That's not temporary, according to me. Uh, no, I'm going to make, make progress, that's OK. It's not a controversial to point out that rent controls limit the stock in the rental market. It's been observed time after time, and it is a mystery why this government is expecting something different. Yeah. And if price fixing wasn't enough, the proposed eviction from, from, from property will add even further uncertainty to the market. Removing the incentive for tenants to pay and lord, landlords to regain their property throws up a litany of issues that I don't think the government has thought through. For one, there are costs associated with letting a property that are met by rental income that is paid. If a landlord cannot rely on a steady stream of rent, many will be unable to fulfil their financial obligations, such as repairs, and we will see properties going into even more worse um, repair. Additionally, some landlords, again here a lot in, Malo in Edinburgh and Lothians, rely on regular rent to pay the mortgage, especially for those with a buy-to-let mortgage. A halt to income could cause the property to be repossessed, which will result in the tenant likely being evicted as well. If the government had thought through the situation, I'm sure, as they would appreciate, they need to bring something different to the table. The other group that are going to be deeply affected by this is housing associations. Banks lend association money with rental income acting as a guarantee against the debt. If the income becomes unsustainable, it is likely they will remove that incentive because suddenly the banks will refuse to lend the money. Yeah. This will bring again another pressure to the sector and we will see the market in regard to rental property simply collapsing. And this is not just me saying this, presiding officer. We even had representations today from COSLA, not necessarily in favour of everything we on this side do. But they have said, they've said this is a power grab by the Scottish Government. They don't, they've said that this is taken away from localism at any level. They're saying that why should local authorities not be sent in rents rather than central government? Setting rent caps and freezes at a national level strips local government of its power. Its ability to set rent for local houses, I'm in my last 30 seconds, unfortunately, and with no consultation with the sector, we are going to end up with more people being homeless over these next few months. This is a fundamentally wrong policy. It will end up with people being in a worse place 
and we will see more people selling their properties simply to be able to meet their own rising costs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Carol Morkin. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Thompson. Presiding officer, I refer you to my register of interest that states I rent some property out. Now, I consider it unethical to speak on issues where it could be construed that I'm attempting to influence the Scottish Government in my own interest, and as such, the speech will make no reference to the buy-to-let market. I will, however, make some remarks on the broader housing market. Fundamentally, the Scottish Government is seeking to do the right thing but they're subjected to limitations. The first is adequate powers. The government's job, above all else, is to protect Scottish citizens, and there's nothing more fundamental than a roof over your head. However, without an appropriate basket of powers, including borrowing, the Scottish government is heavily constrained. The second is a macroeconomic context. The Scottish Parliament has no monetary policy powers and very limited fiscal powers. That is why the Scottish people are facing the full brunt of Tory economic incompetence, rising food inflation, rising mortgage costs, and the recent, quite frankly, disastrous fiscal event by the latest Tory Chancellor and Prime Minister all call for action. So the willingness of the Scottish Government to take action is to be commended. Yet I sound a note, and I'll carry on just now because I'm changing theme. Yet I sound a note of caution and quote from Susan Actimel of Homes for Good. She notes in LinkedIn, the Scottish Government seems to be legislating against new housing supply in the midst of a housing crisis. Now these remarks go to the heart of the very difficult balancing act that the Scottish Government must undertake. How do they take action to protect tenants without cooling the underlying supply of housing? So I'd like to open some areas for discussion. The mood music for institutional professionals in the housing market must be right. They must know that Scotland is open for business and that their long-term investment plans can proceed. Pension schemes in particular with their long-term focus on patient capital must be considered. I would highlight the build to rent model, which offer a route for Scotland to get to the scale of housing required against a backdrop of undersupply and over demand. I reference the Scottish property. If it, sorry. Yes, uh -huh. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. Just that point I made earlier that there's evidence uh, that uh, moves such as rent freeze can reduce the housing stock, which she rightly calls for, uh, that we need more of. So, what evidence does she have, the member, uh, to say that this isn't going to be the unintended consequence of this legislation? Michelle Thompson. I don't have any evidence because I don't have a crystal ball. However, what, I would, the, what I'm pointing out here is that there's a housing market. Uh, we're not having the debate about the housing market. And a critical point of the housing market is macroeconomic powers and fiscal powers that we could take action, for example, to build more houses if we had adequate borrowing powers. And that's the point I'm making. So I'm going to carry on, presiding officer. <laughs> uh, I reference the Scottish Pre Property Federation in that they state there's a pipeline worth of, of 3.5 billion of new built to rent properties and their concern is that some of this be, may be put on hold. For other businesses such as SMEs, their risk assessments are growing more complex and are becoming more risk averse. Access to funding is already problematic with interest rates increasing and exacerbated by the current Tory induced chaos. No one who lived through the credit crisis of 2008 will forget clauses in commercial contracts that allow for a demand for the repayment of bank loans regardless of whether any debt is being serviced regularly. So we need strong guarantees the finance sector this time around will act appropriately to support on businesses. That on, that on that point, specifically about regulatory environment for SMEs, happily. Stephen Kerr. Make the intervention on that point to say that she's making some very good points, but she didn't quite answer the intervention of my friend Liam Kerr. Does she acknowledge that international study after international study shows that the imposition of rent freezes creates constrictions in the supply of available property for the homeless. Michelle Thompson. What I would acknowledge is that 
restriction of supply can have an impact. That is true. And what I'm making clear here is that it's very complex. Now, if, you really, if the member really cared about the housing market, and indeed the member over there, you would be calling for increasing borrowing powers for the Scottish Government to build more houses. You would be increasing the calls for a more macroeconomic powers for the Scottish Parliament so that we can take further action. That is the point I'm making. You want us to sit passively and, with, and leave these matters to the Tory Government in London. We see where that's ended up. Anyway, sorry, Presiding Officer. It's worth noting all these economic factors and many more uh, I haven't mentioned are out with the control of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government, adding emphasis to my opening remarks. House providers are nervous because of uncertainty and the vast majority of that uncertainty is because of macroeconomic policies set in Westminster. Any initiatives must look at the overarching housing sector in the round. So I would like to ask the Minister what specific assessment has been made to the availability of housing supply because of these proposed changes. And will there be checkpoints on supply against demand? These are difficult times. With strictly limited powers, it's hugely difficult to both extend tenant protections and ensure the optimum environment for investment in new housing. The UK government's used the property market to give the illusion of wealth and growth. Ms. Thompson, leading, you are over your time. Could okay, you bring your marks lead, Last sentence. Uh, leading to a bloated asset class. Despite the complexity I've outlined, the Scottish government fundamentally has a duty of care to citizens. And for that reason, I absolutely stand by this legislation. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I now call Cara Mochan to be followed by Emma Roddy. Up to six minutes, please, Ms. Mochan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And before making my contribution today, I refer members to my Register of Interests. I am happy to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate. This action is welcome, but is long overdue. Scottish Labour has been calling for the beginning of this, from the beginning of this cost of living crisis for real, measurable action which will help those in most need. From a windfall tax on energy companies making eye-washing profits while working people struggle, to a rent freeze to support tenants who have been exploited by rogue landlords increasing bills during a time of severe economic uncertainty. It is therefore welcome that the SNP and Green Gov Government has U-turned um, on, on this particular issue. But let us not forget, if the SNP and Greens had backed the proposals from my friend and comrade Scottish Labour's Mercedes Villalba in June, the rent freeze would have been in place months ago. And we would not see tenants having to wait until December, a point that um, the First Minister had implied would not actually be the case. Yes, of course. Minister Patrick. Uh, I, I don't really expect the member to accept this, but I'm just going to put it on the record one more time. If we had voted for that amendment and Parliament had passed it, the rent freeze would not be in place. The rent freeze would have gone to court and been struck down, and we would have done nothing but harm. Karen Mochan. Thank you for the intervention. And the member knows that the position on this bench is, is that, that you could have come forward with an amendment or a discussion on those points at that time. In fact, the proposed rent freeze from the SNP and Greens will not help those who had their rents hiked over the summer, as we've been discussing, after this government's failure to support a rent freeze in June. Um, and when Living Rent and my colleague Mercedes Villalba first raised the need with the First Minister in April, the average rent in Scotland was £780. It now stands at over £850, which I think we can all agree is a significant increase in just six months. So clearly, Deputy Signing Officer, this is not a time for patting the back of a government who before summer said it was unworkable. It is a time to highlight the power of working people and of our trade unions in their campaign to deliver this change. And action and empty promises were never going to be enough during a cost of living crisis. And I am pleased that the Scottish Government has come to this realisation. Deputy Presiding Officer, I do agree with the Scottish Government in that this cost of living crisis is a result of years of irresponsible Tory economic policy, of austerity, of cutting taxes from the rich and increasing costs for the workers.
However we, however, we do have powers to mitigate in Scotland, and we do have powers in social security and through local councils to improve, ser improve service delivery for those most in need. It is often suggested in this Parliament that there is only one way out of this mess. In fact, presiding officer, what the last weeks, months and even years have shown is that Scotland have two governments often set on dividing communities. But the fact that people power brought, has brought about this change of heart in this government today highlights that the people of this country want to unite around policies that will improve their lives and set a brighter future for the next generation. As highlighted in this cha chamber today, tenants and tenants' organisations are knowledgeable enough to come to us here in this parliament and give us sound advice that we should listen to the people of Scotland. Miles Briggs. Full for the member for taking this intervention. I'm not sure from the Labour part the Party whether or not when they envisage this rent control, they envisage the social rental sector being such an integral part of it. Can I therefore ask whether or not members would be voting to remove them from this, given all the unintended consequences which they are raising with elected members? Karen Malkin. Thank you for the intervention. The member will know from my colleague Mark that we have uh, amendments um, and, um, that we're going to bring forward around this issue, but that we do know that we are secure until the end of uh, this financial year, um, and we're happy to debate that again tomorrow in the Chamber. Um, the introduction of this legislation is a welcome step forward. But as mentioned previously, it will not help all tenants and it's by no means a long-term solution to the challenges Scotland face with regards to, to the housing uh, market. Scotland's council are being starved of funding from this government um, and from the Tories in Westminster. And in recent years, Labour and local government have been delivering nation-leading house-building programmes despite these cuts. Essential work. Programmes that are proud once again to be council housing knowing that, it is, that this provides stability and security in the most uncertain of terms. As was mentioned by the member from Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley, a home is more than bricks and water. This is why we must challenge the balance between landlords and tenants, as my colleague Richard Leonard eh, mentioned in his contribution. I do hope the Scottish Government realises the short-term nature of the plans set out in this legislation and call on them to invest in our councils to ensure they have adequate funding to build the required quantity and quality of houses needed in Scotland today. Furthermore, I hope the Minister listens to calls to ensure that the rent freeze remains in place until a national system of rent controls comes into effect. We know we can be bolder, we know we can go further, and I call on the Scottish Government to show that ambition. In concluding, Presiding Officer, I pay credit to my colleague Mercedes Villalba, tenants' organisations such as Living Rent and the trade union movement for the relentless campaigning to force this U-turn. It's a welcome step, one that we know we, we, it will make a positive short-term effect. But Scotland is in desperate need of, re of reformed housing policy that delivers first and foremost for our working population. Today is a step forward, but there now is room um, for us to go forward. And I reaffirm my party's support of the principle of this bill. And I highlight once again our commitment to delivering a long-term housing strategy that meets the needs of our populations. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Malkin. I now call Emma Roddick to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am over the moon that this legislation has been introduced. It was, to me, the highlight of a programme for government which had many policies announced in it that will have a great impact on the people of the Highlands and Islands. This is radical, bold and will have wide-ranging benefits for tenants. Reading the policy memorandum last night genuinely made me proud to be a member of the SNP. Whatever safeguards or caution is in the bill, the intent is very clear to protect tenants by stabilising housing costs, protect their health and well-being and avoid evictions. I told the Orkney News only yesterday that this rent freeze at this time during a very real cost of living crisis will ultimately save lives and I have absolutely no doubt that that is true. In the run-up to winter, making sure that people who are actually paying rent, even rent which is already unfairly high, are able to stay in their homes must be our priority. Yes, I will. Audrey Nicko. I was listening to the and I noticed a question earlier when I came to see... Ms Nicko, sorry to interrupt. Um, could you please resume? I don't think your microphone's on. Uh, 
apologies, presiding officer. Um, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I noticed a question in the chamber earlier on today from Tess White regarding the growing challenge of policing uh, mental health and challenging the Scottish Government to do more. So, would the member agree that housing security is an absolutely essential key well-being indicator for us? And the Tory opposition to the provisions uh, in this bill that seek to provide that housing security is frankly hypocritical. Emma Roddick. Uh, yes, I would, I would absolutely agree that, that housing is, is integral to, to mental health. And I think there is a lot of hypocrisy coming from the Conservative group today. They claim to care about mental health, but they don't support this bill, which specifically has mental health of tenants listed as one of its aims. And they claim to be worried about the amount of time that we are spending debating this bill and yet seem to be wasting an awful lot of it on things that have nothing to do with the content of the bill. I think it's also worth reflecting on the fact that this is, not the only, this is not the only way that the Scottish Government is supporting tenants with household bills and low income right now. Many will be benefiting from housing benefits, including mitigation of the bedroom tax, from the Scottish Child Payment, from an uplift to Scottish benefits, Best Start grants and many other progressive policies brought forward by the SNP Government. Nobody can accuse this government of oversimplifying and trying to address an incredibly complex issue with only one action or thinking that this is a panacea, not without looking a bit ridiculous. This is world-leading work going on in this building, bringing forward legislation on social security and homelessness, which is unprecedented, not to mention constantly criticised by Conservatives, whom I can only assume would rather see us protect the growing wealth of bankers. And frankly, I can't believe the brass neck of some of the members claiming this isn't an emergency bill and criticising an action which is only necessary thanks to the shameful string of right-wing harmful policies announced by the UK Tory government from cutting universal credit to not only failing to act on but being complicit in the increase in cost of energy linked to eye-watering profits in energy companies. It's a great pity that this government, while carrying out such progressive, impressive work, particularly in the social justice, housing and local government portfolio, is so constantly and hugely hamstrung by not having full fiscal powers, not being able to rely even month to month on what our budget is going to be, and not being able to legislate on many of the biggest causes of poverty in Scotland today, like energy policy. Renting was already extortionate before the cost of living crisis, before COVID, before Brexit, and all of these things have only made it worse. The Scottish Government is taking brave action to protect those who need it most, to make sure that tenants can keep a roof over their heads, and that must surely be the most important consideration in this debate. Now, I do recognise there's a need to be able to defend this legislation, and not just to our electorate, but legally. It has to be robust, it has to be strong, and the Government has to have confidence that it can defend it to the hilt. It would be irresponsible and dangerous to present anything otherwise, and that's particularly important when we consider that while landlords and letting associations often have money behind them to take legal action, tenants generally struggle to do the same. But we do have to be careful not to create policy based on which group is most litigious. So I echo my colleague Elena Whitam's call for financial support, which is available to tenants to be well advertised and accessible. We have to make it as easy as possible for tenants to access help. I also agree with her comments on sitting tenants being able to remain in a home when the owner changes. It was pointed out to me this week that if a commercial property were being sold, a sitting tenant would be seen as a positive. It means immediate income following the sale. So if a new owner doesn't intend to live in the property themselves, perhaps we need to encourage an attitude shift towards supporting existing tenants to stay in their home because rented or owned, a home is a home. Over summer recess, I told constituents that I was looking forward to coming back here because we had so much to get through. And we have unfortunately lost a week of business since recess. But even in that context, this bill is worth spending three days and possibly evenings debating. But let's make sure it is a debate and not a foregone conclusion. I'm sure we'll have some cracking arguments over the next two days about the finer points and whether we can or should go further, particularly from Labour, given we start from the same position that this is emergency legislation, responding to an emergency situation and that tenants must come first. On housing, there is always more that can be done, always something you could go further on in theory. And I don't envy those who have to narrow it down to what can be done in practice.
I look forward to taking part in those debates, though, and I hope that in this room of legislators there will be real commitment to explore ideas, to look into possible changes and really consider whether suggestions to strengthen the bill are doable and defendable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Roddick. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Bob, Bob Doris. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This will be a crucial week for tenants across Scotland. We are living through the worst cost crisis for generations, with inflation soaring and bills skyrocketing. One of the biggest expenses people have is housing, which is why this emergency legislation is so important. It provides immediate support to tenants at the sharp end of the crisis this winter. I welcome this bill. It will implement a cap on rent at 0% and significantly ramp up protections from evictions with te within tenancies until at least the 31st of March 2023. It will create a new system to make it easier for tenants to challenge unlawful evictions and bring in tougher sanctions for landlords. It will also grant powers for ministers to reform the way tenants can challenge rent rises in the private rented sector after the freeze. These priorities stand in stark contrast to the cruelty and incompetence of the UK government and its so-called mini-budget, which is a multi-billion pound giveaway to the bankers and polluters and the super wealthy. And it is part, this, led, this bill, is part of a bigger whole. While Scotland already has the strongest tenants' rights in the UK, the Butte House Agreement set out why we need to do so much more to reform renting. And yes, I'll take an intervention from the member. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank the member for giving way on that. There is, of course, uh, legislation that covers rental agreements. The, I repeat the 84, the 88, 88 and 2016 Act, which regulates how much a rent increase could be and a mechanism for disagreeing with it. Do you know which sections those are and what options are available for tenants? Because I'm happy to explain them if the presiding officer gives, does, gives me time. Arian Burgess. I, I really appreciate the members' um, long-standing knowledge and experience in this parliament and for sharing that earlier in, in the debate. But I think at this point in time, I'd like to press on uh, with what I have to say. Presiding officer, over the course of this parliamentary term, we will be introducing the biggest expansion of tenants' rights in more than a generation, including better protections against eviction, improved regulation, more rights, and long-term rent controls. This was a core part of the partnership agreement between the Scottish Greens and the Scottish Government. It is part of our journey set out in the Butte House Agreement to make rents less about maximising profit out of homes and more about affordability, quality and tenants' voices. That vital work continues and it will contribute to the biggest package of housing sector reform since devolution. Presiding officer, too often renting in Scotland is expensive and insecure. Too many tenants pay extortionate amounts to live in damp, cold and overcrowded homes. No home can be left behind if we are to build a recovery that works for people and communities. In the region that I represent, the Highlands and Islands, the need for affordable, I'm, I'm going to continue, thank you. Um, in the region I represent, the Highlands and Islands, the need for affordable, accessible and adequate homes continues to be pressing. Many people struggle to find a home where they want to live and if they do, they face unaffordable rents. The deepening cost crisis has left few people unscathed, but many people who rent their homes will be even more vulnerable to the harsh winter ahead. If the UK government will not act as it should, the Scottish government should do all that it can. Protecting people from rising rents and losing their homes is the right thing to do as winter looms. So, presiding officer, yes. Dean Kerr. I'm very grateful. The member talked about building 
uh, new homes. But I have a letter here from another housing association which says a rent freeze means housing associations will have to cut back on improvement and maintenance programmes. This greatly reduces our chance of meeting the Scottish Government's targets on building new affordable houses. Does the member recognise that consequence? And if so, why is she voting for this legislation? Ariane Burgess. I thank the member for that intervention. For the period covered by the programme for government, the vast majority if not all social landlords, would not be raising their rent anyway. Some social landlords have frozen rents this year, while others have set up extra assistance for tenants, hardest hit by the cost crisis. Patrick Harvey, in his role as Minister for Tenants' Rights, has committed to working closely, and I heard that this morning at committee, with social landlords if measures are extended beyond March, to ensure that there is no adverse impact on long-term plans for more social housing. There is plenty of common ground to build on in making sure that all renters have rents they can afford during this stressful period. So, presiding officer, I am proud that Scotland is leading the way on protecting tenants. No other part of the UK is proposing anything close to the Scottish Government's ambition on protecting tenants. It is part of our journey to join the norm in other European countries where regulation of rents is built into the way housing works. In the short term, this emergency bill will make a substantial difference this winter for people who rent their homes. But ultimately, we need long-term solutions. Part of that is a culture change away from housing being seen as a money-making investment to one that is about providing homes for people. With the powers of an independent country, Scotland could do so much more to tackle the cost crisis head on. Today's bill shows that the Scottish Greens, working constructively in government, are delivering on the promises we made to the electorate in 2021. Ms Burgess, we could you bring your remarks to a close, please? Up. You're well over time. We are choosing to protect tenants, not bankers' bonuses. We are freezing rents, not freezing pensioners. Ms Burgess, you really will need to conclude now. Thank you. We are doing the hard work, the Ms. detailed Burgess, work could you that please delivers. Conclude now. That thank you. Ms Burgess, thank you. Uh, I now call Bob Doris, to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I speak in support of this emergency legislation, which will secure uh, a number of welcome and essential provisions, mainly, as we have heard this afternoon, a six-month rent freeze for tenants across ten years and a similar ban on evictions across ten years for the same period of time. It will be a welcome and valuable measure for many hard-pressed tenants right across Scotland, including in my constituency of Maryhill and Springburn. It will give certainty, stability and support for many for the next six months, something that will be very welcome, given, if we are very honest about it, a cost-of-living crisis fuelled by a Westminster government that has been complicit in that cost of living crisis due to its reluctance to regulate and tax the energy sector, its keenness to cut budgets, certainly in this place, and herald in austerity, and its denial to acknowledge the need to go further in public sector pay awards right across the boards. And of course, that is before we look at the cat handed approach of Liz Truss and Quasi Quartang of the last couple of weeks. That is the context that we debate this emergency legislation in. I think the legislation is a measured approach. There are reasonable caveats built in as to when it may be appropriate to trigger a rent increase or move for eviction during that six-month period. That is to make sure this bill is seen as legal and competent. We have heard that debate before with the previous COVID emergency legislation and the debate in the exchange with Richard Leonard earlier on today, I think, sums up the need to get a balance right in this legislation to make sure that it is indeed legal. However, I do need to flag up potential unintended consequences for the social rental sector, as I have done before in this place. Within days of the announcement, uh, I met with three social housing providers locally in my constituency and have been contacted by several more. Housing associations are anchor organisations in the communities that I serve. They are of great value, not just how they invest in their core rental stock and to improve it and bring with it the energy efficiency standards that we all need to meet to make the, tackle the climate emergency, but also supported by the Scottish Government with grants eh, underpinned by borrowing from financial sectors. Housing associations are also building the next generation of social rented housing, and we must secure those gains and go further. I see that happening right across my constituency.
and also the wider role activities of housing associations in my constituency, be that tackling work to tackle loneliness and isolation in the communities that I serve, uh, supporting vulnerable groups, providing welfare advice and increasingly food and fuel support. They make a difference in the communities that, that I serve. All of that, uh, all of that, that investment in stock and investment in the communities that we serve is in part predicated on rental income from tenants, and we have to remember that. So when housing associations raise very significant concerns, we have to listen carefully. We yes, I will. Yes. Graeme Simpson. Can I thank Bob Doris for taking the intervention. Um, he's, he's right, he has raised these concerns before. Does he accept that the very genuine concerns held by housing associations uh, could, could see uh, invest, the investment that he talks about choked off by these measures? Bob Doris. Can I say to Mr Simpson that I don't think that will happen because I've got an ongoing dialogue with housing associations and making representation to government and government's very much in listening modes. I think Mr Simpson's right to raise those as potential concerns, but I just simply don't think that will happen. But I thank him for raising that, that, that particular <coughs> intervention. Um, so I've, I've made clear what I think is the important situation and the important role that housing associations play in the constituency which I have said. And we've heard already this afternoon how, how, how housing associations plan their finances over 10 years, 20 years, a 25-year period, and they are sensitive to year-on-year -year variations in their predicated rental incomes, including whether there's constraints and the ability to, to raise rents. And we have to be cognizant of that. And I do acknowledge that they've also got a rent affordability tool that they seek to use, and they, have, they are statutory required to consult with tenants, and we have to look at that in the context of any potential rent freeze in the I'm afraid I don't think I'll have time, presiding officer, so I'll, I'll, I'll have to say no to the Mr Rennie. I'd also point out that housing associations, by and large, not always, but by and large, have showed constraint in the last few years. One housing association in my constituency in 2020, Maid Hill Housing Association, had a rent freeze. Now, that has consequences for their finances over a period of time, but they found a way of having a rent freeze in 2020. Housing associations make different decisions at different times, different pacing and a different trajectory of rent increases across different social landlords over the years, depending on their investment priorities and the pacing of that, that investment. So when we talk about a, a rent freeze going forward, we should be cognizant that we're talking about a rent cap at 0%. And a rent cap going forward, if it was to include the social rented sector in the future, doesn't have to be 0%. It could be higher than that, and there could be a differential cap, if there was to be a cap at all, of course. A differential cap which could take into account the statutory consultation process that housing associations have with their tenants, that takes into account uh, the previous rent increases that housing associations have made over a number of years and the constraint that they have already shown, and a variety of other factors that would have to be considered. I have to say, in the round, though, my preference would be partnership conversation and co-production with the social rented sector rather than a rent freeze and a rent cap more generally. But we are in unprecedented times, presiding officer. We have to think of every way that we can stand there to support the most vulnerable in society. And that means we have to think about rent freezes across all tenures. I hope it doesn't happen in the social rented sector. I've put on the record what the potential unintended consequences are. We must keep working in dialogue with them, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Doris. I now call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Michael Mara. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, this bill is a disgrace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is not the way to do legislation. Emergency legislation should be an exception, reserved for wartime or a pandemic, or to make quick updates to law when needed. This does not qualify. This is a complex policy area. You can't rush this sort of thing. Now, I convene the cross-party group on housing, and we've produced a report on rent controls, which took months to do and was meant to help the discussion around this issue. I'll come on to it. But what it shows is that you can't and shouldn't pass this sort of legislation in three days with MSPs given less than a day to scrutinise the bill beforehand. If this law passes, it will wreak untold damage on the very people this government and their Green partners purport to stand up for. This is an attack on the entire rental sector fuelled by the Greens' hatred yeah. of anything private. Yes, yeah. yes I will. 
Bob Doris. I thank, I thank Mr Simpson for, for giving me. I was wanting clarification in the Conservative position. Mr Balfour and earlier contributions seem to be talking about an attack on local democracy, suggesting that the powers to cap and freeze rent across all tenures should sit with councils. Is that Conservative Party policy? Graeme Simpson. Well, this applies to councils as well, as well as the social rented yeah. sector yeah. that Bob Doris talked about. Now, uh, the Greens see the private rent private rental sector landlords as inherently bad, up to no good, and generally out to make a killing off the backs of tenants, as does apparently my good friend Richard Leonard. But how wrong can you be? They produced rushed and flawed legislation, which also attacks the social rented sector, who have been up in arms about it. Others have already spelled out the concerns, but they're worth repeating. As the SFHA said, this policy will do little to increase the incomes of most social housing tenants. Instead, it will threaten both the Scottish Government's ambitions on affordable house building and climate change and our members' ability to provide their tenants with exactly the kind of targeted support that is required in these times. There isn't a problem with high rents in that sector. There will be a problem with investment if this goes through. Any ambitions for targets on the building of affordable homes can be thrown out of the window. The SFHA warn of dire consequences. The Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations fear this legislation could be a precursor to something permanent. They say, they say quotes, state intervention in our sector's rents after March the 3rd 31st, 2023, would set a very worrying precedent and would savage plans, savage plans, to invest in existing and new homes. Well, we know that such intervention could indeed continue beyond March next year because it's in the bill. Andy, yes. John Mason. I, th I thank him for giving way. Would he accept that David Bookbinder from the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum said that he could live with a freeze up to the end of March quite happily? Graeme Simpson. He did say that, and I'll come on to that. Andy Young of the East Kilbride Housing Association told me this has united the sector like never before and will make the delivery of net zero impossible. Mm. It's quite something that a Green Minister is taking a wrecking ball to helping the environment. Yeah. Today, we have had some stark comments from people in the sector who know what they are talking about. David Meliwish, director of the Scottish Property Federation, warned the legislation could see £3.5 billion of planned investment in new private rented accommodation withdrawn. That would be quite an achievement. John Blackwood of the Scottish Association of Landlords is a mild-mannered man who's never been party political in all the time I've known him, until now. He says, quotes, with this bill, the SNP and Greens have put political rhetoric ahead of measures that would achieve real results in solving Scotland's housing crisis. They've neglected the housing sector in Scotland, leaving it to crumble. He calls the bill irresponsible, and he's right. Back to that rent control report that I mentioned earlier. It was balanced in a way that this bill isn't. It looked at evidence from across the world. And one thing we did discover is that there is a lack of robust data on rents in Scotland. What there is shows a mixed picture between property types and different parts of the country. A one-size-fits-all approach is simply wrong, in my view. Our report didn't ask if rent control is desirable. It's a discussion paper which assumed it was coming. And the Minister has been sent a copy. If he's read it, he will know that if this current legislation is extended, there could be severe consequences. There are different ways to control rents, all with pluses and minuses. Now, as I said earlier, it's complicated. And to come back to the point Mr Mason raised, the fear in the sector is that, this, that rent freezes will continue beyond 2023, March 2023. That is their real concern, and that is contained in the bill. Now, Patrick Harvey has not taken a considered approach here. He's taken a mallet to the sector. This haphazard and blunt approach 
to lawmaking must be resisted. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by John Mason. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Um, this dreadful cost of living crisis is being felt across the country. It is resulting in human misery and great harm. And many of my fellow Dundonians and many across the North East are struggling to feed their children, are missing meals themselves and have no idea how to pay their ever-increasing bills. Uh, paying the rent accounts for a huge slice of a family's income. And Parliament must intervene at this moment of crisis. We are right to do so. We cannot do so blind to either the causes or the various impacts of our actions. The only real long-term solution is increased housing supply, and we must guard against actions beyond the immediate emergency that further decreases that supply. I want to uh, principally address my remarks to the issue of student hardship, the impact of the proposed legislation on our universities, and the need for those long-term solutions for university accommodation. One in eight Scottish students have experienced homelessness since the start of their studies. One in three consider dropping out due to financial difficulties. And one in four are unable to pay their rent in full. So little wonder then that the NUS have welcomed this action today on housing costs. University of Scotland, however, have raised with me well-founded practical concerns around university halls of residence and the impact that these laws could have if extended in the way that this bill allows for. If extended to beyond the end of March, it will likely cause significant challenges if rent rises are capped well below inflation. The cost of operating these facilities uh, are subject to all of the inflationary pressures found elsewhere in our economy, including the employment of staff, some of whom are not particularly well paid, it's fair to say. We must remember that these universities are tax-funded taxpayer-funded institutions with a vital social purpose that are already facing down 8% budget cuts from this government. So why are we here? The inflationary shocks ripping through Britain have been triggered by the invasion of Ukraine, but we are being particularly badly hit in comparison to other countries because of the chronic failure of government at UK and Scottish level to ensure we have a resilient economy with energy self-sufficiency, robust supply chains, and economy based on innovation and productivity rather than debt-fueled consumption. And market shocks such as the Quarteng mortgage premium are ruining the lives of many hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of people. The Tory Chancellor's grotesquely inept mini-budget yeah. has added £1,500 to the average mortgage borrower's annual bills. It has resulted in hundreds of mortgage products being withdrawn and costs are soaring for those seeking to buy. And that demand shock will be felt for years and it's going to further chill Scotland's house-building sector, all for zero benefit whatsoever, given the ridiculous series of U-turns that have been undertaken in recent days. But the problems for universities and students is particularly acute. The Scottish Government imposes a business model that drives international recruitment to pay the cost of Scottish students. This has meant a 27% increase in student numbers in the past decade. Take the University of Glasgow, cited by uh, other members already today, where student numbers have risen by 20% in only four years. That is a dramatic and substantial change which would play havoc in any marketplace for accommodation. And despite this 20% rise, there has only been a 10% increase in the available housing for these students provided by the university and purpose-built halls, certainly. Jamie Green. I, I th thank the member for raising an important point. There is a huge shortage of accommodation across our university campuses. That is why the private sector fills in those gaps. The key question facing us, though, however, is will this legislation make that situation better or worse, given the sheer demand for properties and the lack of properties on the market already? Michael Mara. It is clear that we have to, a balance has to be struck between emergency action to deal with the costs that people are facing, students included in that, and some of the rent rises they are facing are absolutely unacceptable. But we have to make sure that there is long-term supply. And I share some of the concerns in terms of the long-term supply in uh, the student marketplace. Uh, university has already told me that developers are cancelling projects given the current circumstances um, they face, so that we have to make sure that there is the possibility of bringing supply back online as soon as possible. Um, the national story on student housing um, alluded to uh, here is even more concerning. In the latest statistics available, there has been a 14 per cent decrease in the number of both private sector halls and university provided accommodation. And all of this has delivered a marketplace with no capacity to, deliver, to absorb external shocks. 
So we have students being told by the University of Glasgow to defer courses and to put their life plans on hold. There's no real strategy that I can see, frankly, no even understanding from this government, that if they insist our universities pursue a never-ending growth strategy, they must put in place the policies to make that possible. In short, more students require more houses. Universities have, certainly have told me in recent days that things are going in the opposite direction. So this rent freeze is an emergency measure. It is right that we act. Yes, sir. Very briefly, Mr. Kerr. Very briefly, I am a great admirer of Michael Mara's intellect. He's making a startling case for voting against this bill. Why is he not voting against it? Michael Mara? Absolutely not. I, mean, I don't think Mr. Kerr has listened to the totality of what I'm saying. There is the absolute urgent need that people have to make sure that we freeze rents across this country. My concern is that in the long run, we have to make sure that we bring supply back online as quickly as possible. And that requires engagement from the government in doing that work, which has been sadly lacking, lacking so far. I'm coming to a close, presiding officer. Thank you. Um, so uh, Paul Krugman says that uh, rent freezes are among the best understood issues in all of economics. It's understood precisely because it has been tried in many places many times. Long-term rent controls will inevitably ch choke off supply, and it is supply that is the honest answer, the only answer to ensuring that more people have a place to call home. Thank you, Mr Mara. I now call John Mason, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak in this debate. Uh, we've had a hugely damaging budget from the Conservatives at Westminster, so disastrous that even the Conservatives at Westminster would not back it. Thankfully, they have now backed down on abolishing the 45% rate, but there is very little in it to help those who are struggling the most. So the question is, how can a much more reasonable SNP and Green administration tackle poverty and inflation? Uh, uh, let me get going a wee bit, Mr Kerr. Um, tag above the inflation with the limited powers we have. Rent is a key and essential part of many people's expenditure and something that the Scottish Parliament can impact on. So it makes sense to look at what we can do on this. We have all heard the accounts of dramatically increased rents, especially in the private rented sector. It seems that some landlords have been increasing rents to as much as the market will accept, rather than linking increases to inflation or their actual costs. Therefore, I fully support action to tackle this in this bill. However, not all landlords have been increasing rents in this way. OK, Mr Simpson. Yep. Graeme Simpson. I thank John Mason for taking the intervention. I mentioned uh, a, a, a report by the CPG on housing earlier. And one thing that we found that there is actually a, a lack of robust data on rents in Scotland. Does he agree with that? John Mason. Well, I'm sorry, I have to say I'm not on either the committee or the CPG on that, so I would be uh, struggling to comment in detail about that. Not all landlords, though, have been increasing rents in such a bad way, and I do think we have a challenge in drafting legislation which will restrain the bad landlords without punishing those who have been responsible. Some landlords in both the private and social rented sector have kept rents down in recent years and so do not have reserves or savings to absorb a rent freeze. Housing associations in particular have been in touch in recent days, as Mr Doris and Mr Rennie have already said, and we had the SFHA, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, at the Finance Committee last Tuesday. Their main points would be that they have been keeping rents below inflation in recent years. They were looking at increases of perhaps 5 or 6 per cent next April, which would be well below inflation of 10 or 13 per cent. And, no, I think I'm going to carry on, if you don't mind. Even this level of increase would mean curtailing new building. One association based in my constituency told me that even without this legislation, they had agreed with lenders to borrow £90 million in the next few years, which was partly to refinance existing loans and partly for development. They are now reducing that borrowing to £50 million purely to refinance and complete, and complete existing projects. They will not commit to any more new build for the time being. If rents are frozen from April, eh, they also tell us that improving properties for energy efficiency will have to be put on hold. Further restrictions on rent could mean staff reductions and reduced maintenance, and the main beneficiary, as has been pointed out before, of a rent freeze would be the DWP, who pay 60 or 70 per cent of all rents. The problem for most housing associations seems to be that they have to balance grant receipts, what they can borrow, reactive and cyclical maintenance, and rent increases. 
any surpluses or deficits go in or out of that same pot. And I used to work in this sector as an accountant, and I can confirm that this is the case. So restrictions on rent increases inevitably mean cuts elsewhere. Now, I do accept that even housing associations are not all in agreement. Members may have seen that Parkhead Housing Association, which is in my constituency, had a letter in the Herald yesterday arguing that they could and should uh, have a, a freeze up to a year or maybe even more. But I think they would want to be allowed to catch up again in the future. Uh, but I don't think that's the thinking of the majority. And I noted in the financial memorandum for the bill at paragraph 37 that it's accepted that if the freeze goes beyond 31st March, the Scottish Government may be required to provide resources to protect RSLs whose financial viability is threatened due to a loss of rental income. And that that strikes me as a scenario we do not want to be in, Mr Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. Um, do you think, um, if we have to go ahead with this legislation, that a better way forward would be simply to have the six-month freeze up to March, and then, if we need to do it again, to bring forward primary legislation at that point, so housing associations have a better idea of what's going to happen, rather than having this uh, dagger hanging over them for another... 12 months. John Mason. Well, I think we do want to uh, perhaps review things in April so that uh, there would be more differentiation perhaps between good and bad landlords, as I have suggested. Can I just also point out to Mr Balfour, I think in his speech he suggested that the government would have power to extend uh, beyond the 31st of March, whereas in fact that is not the case. Uh, Parliament will have the uh, opportunity to make that decision. Uh, can I finally go on and say, in relation to local authority housing, which we do not have in Glasgow, uh, COSLA make the point in their briefing that, quote, rent caps are really not needed for affordable housing as it is affordable. Therefore, I really have a series of questions to ask at this stage in, in the stage one debate. Are we distinguishing enough between responsible landlords, both RSL and private, who have kept rents down in recent years, and those who have made excessive profits? For example, could we take past rent increases into account, say, over the last three to five years, when we set limits going forward? Should it be an actual cap in, in money terms, eh, or should it be in uh, percentages, so that landlords with existing lower rents, even within the, rent, the social rented sector, are not disadvantaged? Uh, I realise I'm running out of time, so I would just uh, welcome the assurance that this, that, welcome the fact that this legislation is to be in place up to 31st March. Uh, I welcome the fact it's going to be reviewed during that time, but hopefully in the new year we can revisit this and consider different options after 1st of April. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. We will now move to closing speeches, and I call on Pam Duncan Glancy to uh, wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to eight minutes, please, Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. People across the country are in dire straits. The Tories have abandoned them, and the SNP are not doing enough either. I agree with the Minister Patrick Harvey in his opening remarks when he said that we are in a humanitarian crisis. Whilst the mortifying UK Government U-turn on income tax might hold back some of the irresponsible damage inflicted on the pound last week, we have now seen just how willing the Prime Minister and our Chancellor are to play games with our economy and with people's lives. Their haphazard approach, introduce, introducing such severe economic measures with no consultation, no forecasts and no Cabinet oversight is terrifying. And I, I'll give way. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful to, to her for giving way. Um, does, the, does she welcome the energy price guarantee uh, that was announced um, over a week ago, two weeks ago, um, that, would, that supports families in this country and gives the greatest help to those who are in the most need? Does she welcome that measure from the UK government? Pam Duncan Clancy. I welcome any measure, but I think it's been wiped out largely by what they've done in recent weeks. Um, I, I know that... I, I know that the SNP agree with us on the, the recklessness that the Tories have ha wreaked with our economy, and Paul McLennan certainly made that clear. Which is why I can't help but wish they hadn't squandered opportunities to take action on rent years ago when my colleague, my colleague Polly McNeill suggested they do. It's also why I wish they hadn't 
um, more they had in more recently in March copied the Tory scattergun cost of living mitigations and in so doing missed an opportunity to divert support to those who needed it most. Instead, they too lined the pockets of the wealthy while failing to do anything specific for disabled people and unpaid carers and barely scratching the surface for low-income families. Meanwhile, these Labour benches were writing them a fully cost of living plan, set out how to do just that, using a targeted approach rather than spreading the money so thin its impact was diminished for those feeling the heaviest weight of this crisis. That plan, of course, included a temporary rent freeze and a winter evictions ban. My colleague Mercedes, Mercedes Villa Alba put forward a vote on, ex on exactly that back in June, and the SNP and Greens refused to vote with us. So today and on this occasion, I am pleased that they listened to us, to, li to living rent and to the trade unions, shared the Tory penchon for a U-turn and came round to the idea. But I stress to the government and, as the Chamber has already heard in some grim detail from my colleague Mark Griffin, there are real-life impacts of its delay. In the time since we urged the government to take action, rents are already rising, as my colleague Carol Mochen has set out clearly. My inbox is filled with constituents in Glasgow unable to afford a roof over their heads, particularly disabled people, young people and students, and my colleague Michael Mara has set out eloquently the challenges students are facing and that must be addressed. And more families are finding themselves homeless than ever before, with homelessness amongst children increasing by 17% last, since last year. Delays have consequences and brave governments take action without delay. Many are facing rent increases for, enforced over the summer months as landlords responded to the cost of living crisis faster than this Scottish Government did. A rent freeze now is too late for them. Had the Government listened to Mercedes Ville Alba in June, or indeed my colleague Polly McNeill in the last session, they would not be experiencing these increases. It's not just delays that have consequences either. The lack of ambition and scale of change of the Greens and SNP do too. Richard Leonard set these out perfectly angrily today. And I have to say I was disappointed to hear the Minister's response. I'm old enough to remember when the member would have been squarely on the side of tenants. Presiding officer, like others, I too would like reassurance on some of the wider impacts of this bill and would specifically welcome the government's reassurance that the bill will not impact the social housing programme and that social housing landlords will not face a black hole of costs to make essential improvements to their homes if the freeze is extended. And on this point, I ask that the Minister could tell Parliament in closing the date that it will be able to vote on his recommendations on the decision to extend or change the provisions of the bill so that registered social landlords can plan for the future. Presiding officer, the SNP's fail... Can I have my time back, presiding officer? We're now tight for time, I'm afraid, so you'd have to accommodate it in your remarks. OK, I'll try and fit it in. I'll try and Henry fit Carson. it in. I'll take a brief intervention. Would, would the member uh, agree with me that much of the, the situation facing tenants is down to demand outstripping supply, and the SNP's government over the last 15 years failing to address the chronic undersupply in social housing? Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I, I agree that, that, demand, um, that demand is outstripping supply and that there hasn't been enough on, uh, done on that, but that doesn't address the problem right here, right now. Besides, officer, the SNP's failure to act fast enough on rents was a failure to protect my Glasgow constituents and others across Scotland. But it's not just on pace they've let them down. They have also let them down on scale, as I've said. We heard today, and not for the first time, that the SNP and Greens have put £3 billion into the cost of living crisis. They have not, and we must say this. This figure includes actions from years and years ago, some of which the the Labour government legislated for. The actual figure of cost of living interventions from the SNP Green government, according to Spice, is a sixth of that, at closer to 500 million. Now that is welcome, but I'd ask that the government don't overinflate action whilst families can't feed their children. All that does is mask reality and lead to complacency. Scottish Labour have set out a whole platform of ideas for this government to pick from that they could up the scale of the support they offer, but sadly they have an inevitable pattern of shouting these down. Cabinet Secretary say they welcome ideas from across the chamber but don't act on them. So maybe this bill is a turning point here and if so I'd like to seize the opportunity and invite them to consider our suggestions for further action. The government could make transport more affordable, having rail fares and freezing them for a year, creating online fuel price checkers and supporting local authorities to reduce the cost of the school of bus journeys. The Scottish Government could also not only save people money on crucial outgoings like transport and get by giving households a rebate on their water bills, but it could also help people get out of problem debt, debt that people are now taking on just to afford basic essentials, not for TVs or holidays, for food 
and rent. And I hope the government will consider action on debt in short order. When the Social Justice and Social Security Committee carried out an inquiry, we heard the public authorities often aggressively pursue debt. So there is much the government can do on this, including by ensuring people in debt keep more of their money by raising the threshold of protected income and have funds from care or disability benefits protected. Not doing so risks destitution. Action should also be taken to write off school meal debt. Aberlour found that 11,000 families across Scotland are unable to pay for their children's school meals. Labour-led Scottish Lanarkshire Council have already set a gold standard on this by wiping existing school meal debt, providing relief to my constituents in Rutherglen. The government could and should do the same across Scotland. In addition, presiding officer, £250 million of council tax debt was referred to sheriff officers in 2021. If the SNP had kept the promise they first entered government on that to abolish council tax, that debt wouldn't exist. However, it does, and right now it's crippling people who are struggling. So we believe that the government should consider what more it can do to ease the burden of collection of council tax arrears too. After a pandemic and now a cost of living crisis, having come from the back foot position from before, people are pushed to their limits. They need support, which is why it's essential to properly fund money advice services too. These services are stretched to their limit and we need to make sure they have resources they need to keep providing their lifeline services to anyone who turns to them. And I welcome the aim in the bill to address the health and wellbeing impact of unaffordable rent rises and ask that the government set out in closing what they will do to support third sector organisations to help people. So, presiding officer, Scottish Labour, as the original proponents of the, reg the rent freeze, will support this bill this week, but believe there is far more this government must do to address the cost of living in Scotland. We on these benches have simple, cost-effective effective solutions in front of us to do this, and I hope the government will consider these wider actions, not leave a delay like they did on rent freezes, and set in motion the wider-scale action needed to get people through this cost-of-living crisis and ultimately save lives in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glancy. And I call on Murdo Fraser uh, for around 10 minutes, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I should start by uh, reminding members of my register of interests. I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I also have an interest in two uh, residential properties which are let on a long-term long -term basis. Now, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, it takes a particular type of government to identify a problem identify, which are, uh, is affecting hundreds of thousands of Scots then actively propose a change in the law that will make matters worse for them. And a particular type of government minister to put forward a policy when the evidence suggests it will exacerbate the problem he is claiming he wants to solve. But that is what we have with this bill before us this afternoon. Now, presiding officer, I'm going to start with a word about, about process because Graeme Simpson, his contribution, uh, talked about the fact that this bill is being rushed through Parliament in three days with no time for detailed scrutiny or consultation with those uh, affected. Mr Simpson is the convener of the cross-party group on housing. He is something of an expert in this particular field. I think he probably knows what he's talking about on this subject, at least, presiding officer. Uh, and I think the comments he makes about the fact that Parliament is rushing this through when we only saw this bill, I think, five o'clock last night, there is no time for Parliament to give it the scrutiny that it deserves when it has huge wide-ranging consequences, as we've heard throughout uh, this debate. Rushed law is bad law, and I fear that's what we're about uh, to make presiding officer. Now, there are already significant issues in the provision of private rented accommodation across Scotland, particularly in our cities. Rents have been rising, that is true, fuelled by a shortage of available accommodation. Ros McCall uh, earlier on reminded us that just two weeks ago, the University of Glasgow was advising students that they might have to consider either suspending their studies or withdrawing from courses due to the chronic lack of rented accommodation within the city. And just last week, we heard that students in Edinburgh were having to be offered beds in dormitory type accommodation because there was simply nowhere else for them to stay. And letting agents report there has been a significant and ongoing reduction in the number of private sector tenancies coming to the market. Yes, I'll give way. Minister. Uh, given Mr Fraser's uh, very passionate concern about supply, uh, I'm surprised that he hasn't wholeheartedly welcomed the measures that we've taken in relation to short-term letting, which has siphoned off what should be proper, affordable homes for people into effectively untaxed hotel businesses. Murdo Fraser. No, sir. 
Mr Harvey doesn't even want to talk about the bill he's proposing today, which is the one that's going to have a negative impact on the supply of rented property. So already we're seeing private landlords frustrated by changes in tenant legislation withdrawing their properties from the market or selling them up or putting them into other use, like short-term lets, Mr Harvey. And those properties which are available too often see a bidding war for higher rents. So I can... Uh, um, yes, of course. Finlay Carson. Do not Fraser agree with me that the SNP Green Government have failed to see the bigger picture, and I have just heard that right now, and the interests of tenants and the interests of landlords are not in opposition, but by preventing any and all evictions and freezing rent, which sounds like an easy short-term solution, tenants may lose out in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that intervention from Mr Carson, who makes his point uh, very well, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, I can understand why the Scottish Government in response to the rising cost of living, thought it was clever politics to, to bring in this six-month rent freeze to apply until the end of March next year. But what they did not consider, it seems, that this would exacerbate the difficulties we have already seen in the private rented sector. John Blackwood, Chief Executive for the Scottish Association of Landlords, said he had been, in response to uh, what was announced by the government, inundated by landlords saying they will be removing their vacant properties from the rental market. Because the consequence of this legislation will be to, be to reduce still further the availability of properties in the private rented sector, leaving students and others in an increasingly desperate situation. And it's simply unbelievable. We have a Scottish Government and a Minister who are so arrogant that they cannot say what the outcome of their actions uh, will be. And at least from the SNP bench, as we heard from Michelle Thompson earlier on, uh, I think a recognition that there will be an impact on the supply of properties uh, if this legislation goes through. Now, it's not just in the private rented sector that we see concerns. A number of members, Willie Rennie, Bob Doris, Graham Simpson and others, talked about the impact on the socially rented sector. The Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, representing the providers of social housing across the country, have warned that this policy will threaten both the Scottish Government's ambitions on affordable house building uh, and those on climate change. And their members' ability to provide their tenants with exactly the kind of targeted support that is required in these difficult times. Several of their members, they, they say, have already been forced to cancel plans for kitchen and bathroom renovations for the next several years due to the projected loss of income from this legislation. And we've also heard, and we heard this during the debate, that the uh, massive investment that will be required to help meet net zero ambitions in our housing stock will be jeopardised by this legislation, as indeed will be the construction of new social housing projects. Uh, Willie Rennie uh, quoted from Kingdom Housing Association of Fife. I referred to them in, in uh, the chamber uh, last week. They expressed exactly those concerns that a number of other housing associations uh, have also uh, referred to. And while the bill being considered this week only initially introduces a rent freeze for six months, there are real concerns that there are plans to introduce rent controls going further than that, a move that can only make the situation much uh, worse. And that point has been made very well, both by the, the Federation of Housing Associations uh, and also by COSLA. And I was very interested to see, in relation to local government, in the, in the policy memorandum in front of the bill, uh, in referring to this, uh, it, it suggests that should the cap be extended, it would remove at least £50 million in income from the business plans of registered social landlords and at least £230 million over the four years to March 2027. Where's that money going to come from? Who's going to make that money up in the budgets of social landlords or in the budgets of local authorities? We've had no answer on that point from the Minister and I hope that will be addressed in terms of the winding up uh, report. And of course, as COSLA say in their briefing, this is extraordinary because this is the government centralising power over rent setting. As they say in their briefing, rent setting has never before been taken out of the decision making of local elected members as a sphere of government. Once again, this government has nothing but contempt for local government and its centralising power in its hands. And as members, uh, a number of members, uh, Stephen Kerr and others, reminded us, all the international evidence shows that rent controls cause housing shortages. We've seen that in Ireland, where following the introduction of rent control zones, only 716 homes were available for rent as at the 1st of August in the entire country.
There are similar issues elsewhere. The average waiting time to lease a rent-controlled property in Stockholm currently stands at nine years. And as Jeremy Balfour said in Berlin, what we've seen is the emergence of a grey market in rent-controlled properties, where landlords will now demand that tenants pay a ridiculous price for furniture, for kitchen appliances and other basic amenities as a condition of renting to get round the rules on rent controls. And the danger is we would see the same here. Yet rather than look at the international evidence, it seems that Mr Harvey and all those in the Scottish Government believe somehow that Scottish exceptionalism means we can buck the trend and somehow introduce rent controls here without seeing the adverse impacts we've seen elsewhere. Now, presiding officer, there are serious issues in terms of the cost of living which need to be addressed. The UK government's substantial intervention to cap the cost of energy will deliver real benefits, particularly for those on low incomes who spend a high proportion of them on heating costs. And perhaps the Scottish government could look at... Yes, we? Of course, we'll give Cabinet um, Secretary. I'm really surprised that any uh, Tory member would but try to give this argument, given that Murdo Fraser must know that every penny and more of that is wiped out entirely by the cost rises of food and fuel because of inflation driven by his government and for those who own their home by interest rates going through the roof. Every penny of that and more will be wiped out. Murdo Fraser. The Scottish Government has got a record high budget. The highest budget in the history of devolution. What are they doing to help those with the cost of living? They are making matters worse, uh, presiding officer. So perhaps the Scottish Government could look at supporting tenants with helping to pay rents rather than bring in a rent freeze. And they claim, presiding officer, to be supporting landlords who are facing additional costs. This is a fig leaf. Landlords are, are allowed, in the event that costs of mortgages go up, to, to increase rents by just 3% more. 3%, presiding officer. If interest rates do go up, as the Cabinet Secretary suggested, it might go up much more than that. Landlords will be left out of pocket as a result. So once again, we see, presiding officer, an SNP, SNP Green Scottish Government not listening to those in the sector, not listening to those representing letting agents and private landlords, not listening to local authorities, not listening to those in the social rented sector, railroading through Parliament an emergency piece of legislation without proper scope for scrutiny and amendment and failing to properly consider what the unintended consequences will be. I fear Patrick Harvey's legacy as a result of this bill will be to drive up homelessness in Scotland and that will be a very sorry legacy, presiding officer. Parliament should reject this legislation today. Thank you. I now call on Patrick Harvey to respond to the debate minister uh, for around 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, uh, it's been, shall I say, a lively and wide-ranging debate. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the differences of views, the divergent uh, values, I think, uh, that are, exist in the Chamber on this issue uh, have been well expressed. Uh, and uh, I think of the, those who have criticisms and concerns about this bill, some of them have been expressed very seriously, and I'll try to address them. Uh, some have been a little more on the silly side, uh, and in particular, I find it difficult to take seriously the accusation from the last speaker uh, that we're only doing this because we thought it was clever politics. This from the party that thought it was clever politics to abolish the top rate of taxation until they realised that everybody outside of Tufton Street was revolted by the values behind so, that kind of politics. So, no. I'm going to... All right. Murdo Fraser. I'm grateful to Mr Harvey for giving way. If, if, if the root cause of rising rents is a mismatch between supply and demand, why is he proposing a piece of legislation that will reduce supply? Minister. I, I don't accept the premise that it will, and I also don't accept that that is the only issue affecting rent rises. It's not the only one. There are also those landlords who are simply uh, raising rent to, I, I quote even one, to keep pace with the market, uh, and that is, that is simply exploitation. I'll I want to address, presiding officer, first of all, some of the slightly more technical points that have been raised. In particular, uh, there are valid questions around uh, reporting uh, uh, duties on government and the decisions about how uh, uh, any discussion around possible extension of these uh, measures will be taken forward. Uh, the questions around whether there will be robust uh, planning uh, and, uh, and reporting. These are very fair questions, and I engaged, I, I'd like to make some progress. I, I engaged with the committee this morning and offered to remain engaged with them uh, on this point. Uh, 
uh, but it's also uh, very clear under the terms of the bill that we have to review the operation of the bill every three months to consider whether, whether the provisions remain necessary and proportionate. Uh, we'll have to review whether the measures uh, for a rent freeze and eviction moratorium remain necessary and proportionate in light of the changing economic circumstances, and that will include considering the available evidence of the impact of the measures and how that changes over time. Uh, uh, briefly, please. Miles Briggs. Thank the Minister. Uh, can the Minister outline how the figure of 3% 3, 3 was arrived at for the maximum increase for rents agreed by the adjudicator? Minister. Uh, well, that figure is not an absolute, of course. The provision that does exist within uh, the, the bill for the government to come forward with a change of that. And we'll look at that in light of changing circumstances. There have also been a number uh, of calls throughout the debate for the government to spend more money on all aspects of housing. Uh, absolutely, I understand. If we were able to throw money uh, at direct uh, tenant support, uh, more than we have done already, at social housing provision, more than we have done already, at retrofitting, more than we have done uh, already, or indeed at the cost of uh, the tr running the tribunal, and the wider cost of living measures that Pam Duncan Glancy mentioned, I think we have a strong track record of prioritizing these things. But we also have to say we don't yet know what scale of brutal cuts are coming down the line from the UK government. Uh, and so the emergency budget review, the, I, I'm going to have to make some progress. The emergency budget review will have to consider all of these. Uh, several members have mentioned the purpose and necessity for this measure. And I welcome the comments from Mark Griffin uh, from the Labour benches, recognising that thousands of pe people are being pushed to the brink, a crisis indeed made worse by the UK uh, government. And uh, Eleanor Whittam uh, spoke of a clear and present danger from the current cost crisis, uh, and again recognising that some of that lies uh, at the, 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 the hands of the, the Chancellor over the last couple of weeks. The measures in this bill do provide direct protection in terms of rent, but they do more than that. They also provide a sense of security, uh, a good reason to uh, ensure that all tenants in all sectors uh, do have equal protection, at least for these first six months, is to ensure that everybody has that, that sense of security. And Emma Roddick spoke about the direct connection between a secure sense of, of being secure in one's home uh, and the impacts uh, on mental health. I'd like to emphasize just briefly a couple of points that didn't come out very much during the debate, and I hope that we'll discuss them later in the week. The measures on penalties for unlawful evictions and the powers for uh, changes to rent adjudication will be very, very important in how these measures are implemented, uh, and I hope that we'll, uh, we'll have further discussion of that later in the week. Now, very clearly, uh, for some people in the chamber, uh, the provisions uh, s signal the end of, uh, of private renting or some sort of imagined hostility that we have to the, to the rental sector. For others in the chamber, the measures don't go far enough. Uh, I, I have to th say that I, I think Richard Leonard's suggestion that this bill does nothing to strengthen tenants' rights, uh, I'm afraid, is, is frankly uh, absurd. Uh, it's, it's very clear that, uh, that some members think none of this sh should be done at all and others uh, are still demanding the impossible. Mr, Mr, Mr. Leonard uh, asked why we're not placing the onus on landlords. That's exactly what this bill does. Landlords will be the ones who have the opportunity to apply for a limited prescribed set of costs to be taken into account within clear limits. Uh, and uh, I think I heard a uh, call for an intervention. Richard Leonard. Does the Minister not accept, and he's the Minister for Tenants' Rights, and we've heard an awful lot this afternoon about the defence of landlords' rights, but does he not accept that the argument that we are making is that not that these should simply be temporary changes to the balance of power between tenants and landlords, there should be permanent changes to the balance of power between tenants and landlords? Minister. I, I do, and that's why the government has a long-term programme of, of reform uh, under the New Deal for Tenants that we consulted on and that we'll be working on permanent legislation. But he's well aware that temporary emergency legislation needs to be justified as proportionate in relation uh, to the immediate circumstances. That, indeed, is what we are doing. To, to move on, presiding officer, a great many members spoke about the potential impact, as they see it, on the social rented sector, and that's extremely important to the government. Miles Briggs and Mark Griffin, from different perspectives on this debate, uh, shared some of the concerns on that, and some of these concerns are very legitimate. Uh, some suggested that this measure has already had an impact on the rental income of RSLs. That 
is not the case. Uh, it will have no direct impact uh, on the rental income of RSLs during that first six months. Uh, no, indeed, how about the UK government having an immediate impact on, on RSL's cost of borrowing? Just today, during this debate, we see yet again uh, a major lender saying that they're increasing uh, their interest rates. That will have an impact on RSL's ability to borrow. And I guarantee you, presiding officer, that move was not a response to the Scottish Government's emergency legislation. That move was a response to the UK Government's yeah. mini-budget. And I give way to whoever it was who was uh, asking Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Minister. I mean, I'm looking at the financial memorandum, and my problem is that you estimate the costs to landlords being somewhere between uh, 3 million and 32 million, which will have a direct effect on government income because that will be less income tax raised. Could you not be a bit tighter on that? And, and do you have a feeling on how much income it will affect coming into the government? Minister. Uh, I, I don't believe that we've uh, precisely modelled the, the uh, income uh, to the government, the revenue to the government through income tax. But then, of course, many of the measures in this uh, bill. Uh, are subject to extension or potential early expiry if the economic circumstances change. And, for example, uh, the measures on uh, prescribed limited costs, the percentages of 50 and 3 per cent, will be variable throughout the life uh, of this bill. Listen, I, I was talking about the impact on the social rented sector uh, and saying that the impact has not been to immediately reduce their rental income. That is absolutely the case. But we want to give the social rented sector confidence that the long-term impacts will be taken into account and that we share their priorities uh, about their, their fundamental purposes. Social landlords are, uh, exist for a social purpose and they invest not only in quality of affordable uh, rental uh, housing uh, but on retrofit, the net zero agenda, the wide range of other services. Government shares that priority and the government understands the ways in which the social rented sector are fundamentally different. That rental income is reinvested for the public good uh, and uh, the, the various other differences that have been mentioned. That's why we've invited uh, representatives of the social rented sector and others to take part with us in a short life task and finish group that will inform how these measures are used in the longer term. There have been very productive first meetings uh, of that group uh, that will recognise those circumstances and I genuinely believe that there is creative thinking already being brought to bear about how we go forward in a way that protects tenants without endangering those other issues. Presiding officer, is there a problem? I'm trying to catch Mr Fraser's eye so I don't have to call him out for me carrying on a okay. private conversation while you're speaking. But please continue, Minister. Well, th thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, RSLs are not-for-profit bodies. They exist for social need, uh, and we share their priority to, pro to protect uh, those uh, public investments. I want to move on briefly and talk about the, uh, the private rented sector. There have been some claims. I, I'm not sure that they're uh, really justified claims about a direct impact on supply here. Over the long term, over the years, there has been an improvement in the quality of regulation uh, of the private rented sector, and at the same time, the sector has continued to expand. And indeed, uh, I have a quote here from uh, one uh, build to rent uh, uh, business. Uh, who, uh, Springfield Properties, who have recognised that these temporary measures are designed to support families facing fuel poverty this winter. And they've gone on to say, we continue to believe that the delivery of PRS housing offers a viable revenue stream in the longer term. So uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I uh, agree with the idea that there's some direct impact between having short-term regulation uh, fundamentally changing the long-term viability of the sector. Uh, and Eleanor Whittam was quite right to point out that there are several countries in Europe with higher regulation than we have and rent controls, long-standing systems of rent controls, with a thriving rented sector, including with private investment. I think in many ways there's an analogy here with the, the scaremongering that was brought in when people first debated uh, a minimum wage. Some of those arguments uh, clearly were, were born out of self-interest and didn't come to pass, and I think in many ways the arguments around rent controls are similar. But there is a wider question here, presiding officer. If we don't do this, if we don't accept the responsibility uh, to control some of the eye-watering rent increases that some of our constituents have been faced with, uh, 
just because we believe that that's how the market works, then what are we to do? We'll be leaving them with a situation that is simply uh, unacceptable. It's clear that this cost crisis is being felt right here and right now by people who rent their homes. We are determined to take action to help people keep a roof over their heads uh, uh, in, during a crisis that is not of their making. So, presiding officer, the bill we've introduced presents a package that is both impactful and practical. It's radical and robust. Its purpose is to offer increased protection to tenants who are more vulnerable uh, to the cost crisis than others, but it also recognises that some landlords can be impacted by that cost crisis by including safeguards that address specific, defined and limited circumstances uh, that they uh, uh, will face. And it also builds a bridge to that longer-term work that we're doing on the New Deal for tenants. So in conclusion, presiding officer, many of the important points that have been made in today's debate have been heard. I'm grateful for members who have brought them. I'm also grateful for the time that the committee took this morning to consider the bill. And I look forward to these discussions continuing as members debate uh, the bill over the rest of this week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Minister, that concludes the debate on cost of living tenant protection Scotland Bill at stage one. It's now time to move to the next item of business. The next item of business is uh, consideration of motion 6179 in the name of John Sunny on a financial resolution for the cost of living tenant uh, protection Scotland Bill. And I call on John Swinney uh, to move the motion. Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. Um, the question is that motion 6178 in the name of Patrick Harvey on cost of living, tenant protection, Scotland bill at stage one is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we'll move to a vote. Um, there will be a short suspension to allow members uh, uh, to access the digital voting system. Okay, colleagues, the question is that motion 6178 in the name of Patrick Harvey on the cost of living, tenant protection, Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Members should cast their votes now. <laughs> 
That is the vote closed. Point of order, Claire Adamson. Wouldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms. Adamson. I will make sure that is recorded. The result of the vote on motion 6178 in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes 88, no 29. There were no abstentions. Uh, the motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 6179 in the name of John Swinney on financial resolution, cost of living, tenant protection, Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, there we now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by Hamza Youssef on the health and care recovery and winter planning. The Cabinet Secretary, members who are leaving the chamber should do so as quickly and quietly as possible. In fact, I will pause to allow a change in the front benches. How about that?